Welcome to the Sneak Preview, our third podcast. I'm Connor as Gary. I'm Austin Johnson. We are here to talk about the current film calendar. Granted, not much these days, but we are planning for the future. This is our new podcast covering everything that's happening in film now. Just the constant evolution of new film and new movie news, celebrity deaths, anything that happens that's significant to film in the now is going to happen now, every Monday. So. Yeah, man. <laughs> Super exciting. I think, you know, every Monday we'll be able to talk about what's happened on, you know, that Thursday, Friday, Saturday sort of thing. You know, what movies have come out, what news has come out and like you said, you know, the landscape has changed, but it doesn't mean that there's not new releases. You know, HBO Max alone has over 20 films coming out through Warner Brothers uh, in 2021. Uh, we'll have plenty of Netflix releases to talk about. Um, you know, the Oscars are going to be on April 25th. We'll get to kind of talk about those. Uh, we'll make fun of the Golden Globes for a little bit. <laughs> you know, there's so many things happening all the time if you just just look in the right place. And uh, that's what the sneak preview here is for, is uh, talking about now and what's going on and maybe maybe even giving the audience a few movies that people might miss. You know what I'm saying? Something on Shudder, you know, something that maybe is going under the radar. Uh, that's that's what we're here to do is kind of, you know, be a little bit of a guide. Yeah, absolutely. And this is going to be a very uh, kind of improvisational, up in the air, constantly changing show because... Yeah. The film landscape right now is really rocky because of COVID-19. Yeah. So we're not going to be able to see a lot of films in the theaters. That's going to be very touch and go. We're going to be covering as many streaming films as we can until the theaters are back up and running with a vaccine and everything is peachy. So until then, we're going to be operating at roughly half capacity, but I don't care because we're going to make this the best badass podcast we've done yet. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely will. You know, we're going to be doing, implementing different ideas and different fun things to just, you know, kind of complement maybe what's going on. You know, if there's a, a director who's coming out with a film, you know, a, a good example would be like Mank coming out, David Fincher's Mank back in December, talking about that obviously. And, and, you know, talking about David Fincher himself and doing top fives for him or top fives for Gary Oldman and, different kinds of drafts. We're going to do a lot of that kind of fun stuff here as well. And we're excited to, you know, give it a go. And of course, today we're going to start off with a bang. Absolutely. Um, I do want to inform the audience that uh, this is going to be a very uh, rotating chair kind of show. So it won't always be Austin. It won't always be me. In some cases, there will be uh, a variety of our teammates uh, leading this show. It'll be pretty much whoever's seen the movie of the week. So you're gonna hear some very different voices on this show. I'm excited to see where that goes. <laughs> oh yeah, it's gonna be super exciting. These days, it seems like everybody has kind of the main six or seven streaming services. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's kind of like cable these days, and mm -hmm. everyone <laughs> everyone has them. So that's kind of how our team will communicate and just watch things together through these streaming services because of the you know COVID situation, and the, the theaters being where they're at, and we live in San Antonio and unfortunately Texas has not handled things as well as other States. So, um, you know, it's like you said, it's touch and go. It's, it's, it's a tough, that's a tough subject, you know? Yeah. And we're going to try to stay, you know, relatively upbeat here because this is movies. This is, you know, not just, you know, it's, it's constantly changing here and I'm excited to kind of just go all over the place. And uh, I guess with that, We'll get into our first segment, which may sound familiar to past listeners of Filmgasm and Oscar Sunday. It's time to talk about what happened last week in film. Last week in film. So, uh, this is a segment we've done on all three shows now. <laughs> Always trying to find a home for this one, and I I think this is it. This, this makes the most sense. It. <laughs> this is definitely it. Yeah, won't be moving from anywhere from here on out. This is where we're going to be talking about the current movie news. So, starting uh, with the release of Wonder Woman 1984, inevitably, everyone started saying, well, when are we doing part three? 
And DC and Warner Brothers have announced they are indeed doing Wonder Woman 3 with Patty Jenkins returning to direct and Gal Gadot returning to play Wonder Woman. Have you gotten a chance to see Wonder Woman 1984 yet? No, and uh, I'll say that I very much dislike this part, uh, what Wonder Woman has done, what Wonder Woman 1984 has done. I very much dislike that part of movie fandom because it seems to have gotten, across the board, seems to have gotten, you know, eh, you know, it was whatever to a lot of people, right? But the amount of talk it's gotten and the 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 quickness that a third one now is going to to definitely come with the same team just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. It's not a conversation that is really positive because a lot of people are kind of dogging 1984. And I, I just don't really get it, you know? <laughs> I don't really get it. And but people are obsessed with wanting these DC movies to, you know, succeed and do well. So shit, hopefully the third one's better. I I just I have not seen. 1984 i eventually will but because of the backlash it got i was turned off and i watched soul instead it is interesting i mean the anticipation for this film was through the roof it was supposed to come out um, in october of 2019 but kept getting pushed before covid for some reason and uh then when covid hit it just kept getting pushed further and further and then finally they announced it's going to be debuting on HBO Max late December and theaters. And uh, yeah, what a letdown. It's We've seen DC squander so many second chances. It's ridiculous at this point. Like I, I've lost pretty much all faith in Warner Brothers' ability to handle these properties. And it's really, it goes, for me, it comes all the way down. It's the suits, straight up. I know that. Because the reason the first Wonder Woman was successful is because Patty Jenkins was left alone to her own devices to make a movie her way. And I know that the suits micromanaged the shit out of part two because they needed to figure out why was the first one a hit, not realizing they're the problem. (laughs) And here we are. Again, it's Suicide Squad again. It's Batman versus Superman again. I I mean, come on. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's like, it it seems like, people want to have that conversation about like, Oh, we got, we got screwed again as fans. Like why, why let's just fucking move on. You know, uh, I guess that's hard when, when it's the, these characters that are so dear to people's hearts, you know, wonder woman and these different DC characters, you mentioned justice league, um, Batman versus Superman, <laughs> just Jesus Christ, you know, Th- things just did not work, uh, time and time again. I just, I wonder when people will give up. Well, I think it's not just that it's not working. It's just that nobody's doing anything about it. No, nothing's changing. They're, they just keep making the same mistakes. And also, to a lot of people, Wonder Woman 1984 was the only big movie they were going to be able to see this year. And people were really looking forward to this being awesome. Early reviews said it was amazing, and now I'm pretty sure those were bought. So, yeah, I think it was just such a disaster. And frankly... I don't really, I don't think Wonder Woman 3 is going to be that good either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just, I'm not excited to watch 1984 and I'm not excited to see what happens in the third one because of this, all of this that happens around it. It's kind of a shit storm. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Well, I'm still looking forward to Patty Jenkins' take on Star Wars Rogue Squadron because uh, most of what they've been doing with Star Wars, you know, Disney. Has been good. Uh, wasn't too big on the sequel trilogy, but I am a huge fan of The Mandalorian, and I'm excited to see where they have to go. But yeah, Patty Jenkins uh, can pretty much write her own ticket to this at this point. And uh, yeah, I'm hope she I hope she uh, pulls it out of the fire. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, no kidding. You definitely want <clears throat> her to bring some of that original magic from the first Wonder Woman, where it was kind of like, oh, there's some sincere style here within a massive, huge budget superhero movie. And that's cool to see. Yeah, it is cool to see. And we see that all the time in Marvel, but it's exceedingly rare in DC these days. Yeah, which is, you know, obviously Star Wars being Disney. They're going to go ahead and steal her. We'll take (laughs) Patty. We'll take Patty and we're going to use her in the right way. Yeah. Yep. Well, moving on. Um Ernest Klein recently released his follow-up novel to his uh, 
bestseller, Ready Player One. Ready Player Two came out in December and is already getting fast-tracked for a film adaptation. I was a huge fan of both the movie and the book, Ready Player One, and I am very excited about this. <laughs> Never read the book. I've seen the movie... Uh, we were working at Alamo Draft House when uh, that movie came out, and I didn't see it in theaters. I should have, obviously. It's definitely a theater kind of movie, but I watched it at home, and I it was all right. I was entertained. You know, I thought the references were were pretty pretty cool, pretty rad. But I wasn't super down with like the main character or many any of the human aspects of it, honestly. Uh, but I thought visually it was stunning i wish i would have seen it in theater so i you know this <laughs> you know talking about this is tough because ready player two is that what it's called <laughs> you you would you would hope that it can get a nice big theater release one day well the big thing is the book is not getting very well uh received ah okay and i got the book for christmas so i'm excited to read that but i've not heard positive things <laughs> yeah but Spielberg, when he adapted the first book, pretty much gutted it, took out the bare bones, and made his own story. So he might do that again. Well, I mean, if anybody can do it, it's Steve. So, <laughs> Ready Player One is a film I'm very excited to one day do on the Filmgasm podcast because it's just, for an 80s geek, it's unbelievable. It really is cool. To get to see... The Iron Giant fight Mecha Godzilla. I mean, are you kidding me? <laughs> How do yeah. you not lose your shit? I went to the employee screening of that, and it was during a huge storm, and um, the power went out right when Mecha Godzilla showed up. Oh, and I was so pissed, and I had to go home in that rainstorm. So it was just a bad night. And then, like a couple days later, it was my it was a day off, so I went and saw the movie. You know, and I finally got to see how it ended. But I was like, this was awesome. So yeah, big fan of that movie. And uh, I really hope the sequel works out. Yeah, man. Yeah, no, I, I hope we get to do that on Filmgasm, like you said, uh, soon, sooner than later. Because I would like to revisit it. I, you know, I've just seen it the one time. I'd like to sit down and watch it again and get excited for that, that sequel. Next up, speaking of sequels, uh, Creed 3 has been confirmed with Michael B. Jordan directing it. Hey. Very excited. Tessa Thompson also returning. Uh, no word on Sylvester Stallone, but I would bet he sits this one out. I think yeah. Rocky's story's done, and it's time for Donnie's story to kind of really take off here. Yeah, it's time for just Michael B. to, to be in charge here. Uh, that's that's really special, right, for him to move into that that space where he's acting and directing at the same time. And I'm all I'm all for that. I think both those films, Creed one and two, are are solid, solid flicks. And you know, I don't see why a third one wouldn't be uh, just as good or better. I was not expecting Creed two to be that good, and it it really was. <laughs> yeah, it, it's solid, man. It rocks. Essentially, a follow up to Rocky four, maybe the goofiest of the Rocky films, but it really heightens the drama between you know. I, Ivan Drago and his son Victor. I thought that was brilliant. I thought Dolph Lundgren stole the show as just like a broken, subdued Ivan Drago whose entire country has turned on him. Like, who'd have thought? <laughs> Incredible. Yeah, Rocky IV is my favorite of the of that. You know, the first first six there. I just I love it so much. So seeing, yeah, that was pretty special. Seeing that kind of come back to life. Um, love love that stuff, man. I think Michael B is a a dude that we are always going to be on the lookout for, uh, for the next fucking 30, 40 years. He's certainly a superstar right now. And for him to get a trilogy essentially here is, is pretty cool. The age he's at. That's pretty cool. I wonder if he's going to fight like Mr. T's kid or something. Hey, there you go. <laughs> that'd be, that'd be fun. I don't probably not. They'll probably do like an original thing, but I don't know. I try. I, I have faith because those films have been just consistently great. Um, this one's unfortunate to hear because I was very much looking forward to this, but uh, Mike Flanagan is no longer directing an adaptation of Stephen King's revival. The adaptation is dead in the water due to budget issues. Oh man. Yeah. One of his best 
novels of the past t- 10 years. And what a great director to helm it. Mike Flanagan yeah. already proved himself with Gerald's Game and Dr. Sleep. And now he's going to do Revival. I was so psyched. And now it's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I remember you bringing this up. That that hurts, man. Uh, Flanagan's a name that we've brought up a few times over on Filmgasm. It's just a, a guy we appreciate from this past decade, what he's trying to do in the horror genre. And of course, horror is going to always come up because that's what we love, baby. <laughs> Revival. Um, if you ever get a chance, if you ever have, if you ever have some time to like sit down and read a full book, I, I recommend Revival. That's one of the scariest books King's ever written. It's lights out. It's it's stuck with me for like six years now. It's the ending is so mind bendingly freaky that I was like seeing shadows around my room. It's like it, it it got to me like in my soul. I was very impressed. So I really <laughs> wanted a movie. <laughs> God damn. Ah, I think Mike Flanagan was going to do another one. Uh, it was either him or um, Andy Muschietti who did it. One of them was going to do the long walk and one of them was going to do road work. Both uh, Bachman stories from the seventies. Andy was road work. Yeah. Okay. So that means Flanagan was probably the long, the long walk. Yeah. I hope those still happen. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Oh, damn. Next up, uh, Richard Donner. Um, a director I don't think has ever really gotten the praise he deserves uh, now pushing like early nineties has confirmed that he is going to be helming lethal weapon five as his last movie. Uh, Unbelievable. I'm pretty, yeah. I'm pretty sure Mel Gibson and Danny Glover are both going to come back for this. Uh, I, I, I like the lethal weapon movies. I think they're all pretty entertaining, but Richard Donner deserves a spot in the director hall of fame for the omen the Goonies and Superman. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's <laughs> you don't need to say anything else. <laughs> have you seen the Lethal Weapon films? Yeah, yeah, I have. And, you know, honestly, I didn't see them until I watched It's Always Sunny, <laughs> you know, kind of make fun of it. So that's when I was like, OK, I should see these movies and they're fun. They're not they're not totally totally up my alley, but I like those two together because it's, it's just hilarious. And again, uh, I would have been maybe, you know, 18, 19 or 20, somewhere in there when I first went down that road, the lethal weapon road. <laughs> have you ever seen the film uh, Maverick from 1994? No, no. I've heard, heard things about it. <laughs> it's, it's pretty cute. It's, it's funny, yeah. but there's yeah. a scene where Mel Gibson's at the bank and he's uh, the bank gets held up. And the the bank robber's uh, mask slips for a second, and it's Danny Glover. And yes, Maverick and and the bank robber have they share an ex, an exchange like, wait a minute. <laughs> and as he's as they're leaving, you hear Danny Glover go, "I'm getting too old for this shit." <laughs> it's 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 stupid, but it, it's nice. That's good. I like that. <laughs> I like that a lot, Maverick. <laughs> um, this was. Interest. I'm wondering what you think about this because I think this sounds absolutely stupid. Um, Hyde Park Entertainment is developing a Rubik's Cube movie. Uh, I don't not understand. A about, not a movie about the making of the Rubik's Cube, but a, a Rubik's Cube movie. Like, I don't... How? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure on that one. I, I think... Um... I think I'll just go on blind, I guess, on that one, because I don't really know what's happening with that it's, synopsis. It's like making a Bop It movie. Like, what the what, what does that even mean? <laughs> yeah, never... wait. So it could be like a, a toy or a, yeah, a game. Uh, and it's, are we saying it's from the perspective of the Rubik's Cube? I don't know. I, I think, I don't know. You know what? I would bet, I bet it's aliens invade Earth and only a Rubik's Cube wheeling teenager can stop them. I guarantee you that's what it's going to be about. Because that just sounds stupid enough for some studio to green light a Rubik's Cube movie. Yeah, I, I guess I'm really confused. Uh, but uh, <laughs> this yeah. is the news these days. Yeah, this is all I could find on this. It's just it like was announced today that they're building a, a movie around the Rubik's Cube. <laughs> that's it wonderful. Just, it sounds like an SNL sketch. It doesn't sound like a real. Yeah. Movie. Yeah, I guess well, we'll just, isn't there? 
isn't there a a film called Tire? Is that correct? Rubber. Rubber. My bad. And uh, I've seen a bit of it. I, I haven't seen the whole thing. Uh, maybe it's like that. I maybe I I don't know. I I keep coming back to like the Battleship movie from a few years ago. And oh Lord, have mercy! Something like that. Okay. It's just. Yeah, I get that would the, be that would be worse. Yeah, I get the appeal of making wanting to make films based off highly successful properties. You know, books. I get it. TV shows. I get it. Toys. It gets murky because there's no story there to adapt, and there's no real narrative. Like they got a Barbie movie coming out in a couple of years, and I don't, I don't know, I, I don't know what they're trying to do with this. Like. Yeah, I, I got nothing. I I got nothing. <laughs> it's it's just in, it's gonna stay in my head. I'm gonna be thinking about this forever until I get more information. Like Rubik's cube movie. How? Why? Who? Like yeah, yeah. No, that's definitely gonna be in the back of my brain, just kind of bothering me. I can see that coming out in like 1987, but not not now. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, And we're going to end this segment on two uh, sad notes. Uh, Joan Micklin Silver, director of the films Between the Lines and Crossing Delancey, among others, uh, has died at 85 years old from vascular dementia. And I know you uh, saw the film Between the Lines. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Between the Lines actually just got put back on uh, Criterion, of course, uh, on Criterion Channel. I watched that, yeah, a few months ago and was sort of blown away by by that movie <clears throat> how funny how funny it was so yeah i highly recommend checking that out now uh, i i would assume it's on maybe on hbo max too or something i don't know but it's definitely on criterion right now right on i don't know any of her other films i yeah just not a director i ever uh, knew about but no now now i now i do you know i i that wasn't intentional i just kind of watched that movie on a whim uh, a yeah. few months ago i was just scrolling through criterion and looks like a cool ass cast and it, it is and just kind of went for it. And so I definitely want to see what else she's done. Yeah, for sure. And um, this one, I just found out about a few hours ago. Um, Bond girl, Tanya Roberts, uh, who played Stacy Sutton in 1985's view to a kill uh, has unexpectedly passed away at 65 years old from an undisclosed uh, reason. She was apparently walking her dog and collapsed. And, uh, yeah, A View to a Kill, while not the best Bond film, it's really fun. And it's weird seeing her when she was in her 20s, like, sex it up with, like, 65-year-old Roger Moore. But, yeah, she was very memorable. She also played Donna's mother in That 70s Show, for fans of that show. And, yeah, this was just kind of shocking. 65's, you know, pretty young for just an unexpected collapse. Well, yeah, just, yeah, especially in that manner, walking your dog and out of nowhere. It's just, that's, that's terrible. Yeah. So it's a damn shame. Rest in peace to both y'all. Um, that is all for last week in film. Uh, yeah, I think this works here. I like it. Good home. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely, <laughs> it definitely, definitely fits here on, on the old sneak preview. The old sneak preview. So before we get into uh, the meat of our show, which is the top 20, top 10 films that we each saw in 2020, we thought it would be fun to kind of narrow the playing field a little bit more and talk about the f- some films this year that we watched for the first time. Films that did not come out in 2020 and also had no connection to either of our podcasts. So these are films that we just found on our own, that we watched on our own, and we loved. So these are our top five first-time watches. <laughs> yeah, so that would that would take away films like Ichi the Killer, you know, Norma Ray, for you, Kramer vs. Kramer, you know, yep. these movies we saw for the first time through The Brood, mm. these movies we saw for the first time through um, <clears throat> episodes that we did, not just uh, not just the episode itself, but content around the episode. So for, for instance, um, episode 25 of Oscar Sunday is Kramer vs. Kramer, and we watched <clears throat> all five nominees for best picture from that year, which would be Kramer's Kramer, 
Norma Ray, Breaking Away, all that jazz in Apocalypse Now. And you know, some of those are those some of those are first timers, right? So yeah, they don't they don't count here. This is stuff that we watch like in our spare time. Yeah. And and for me, <clears throat> I know I know you've been on a journey that'll let you speak on, but I've been on a journey through the Criterion channel that I just signed up for uh, in March of 2020, you know, whenever things kind of got shut down I was like, Oh, I want to get more shit so I can watch more movies and sign up for Criterion. And I, it was one of the best decisions of my life. (laughs) And I definitely, it's definitely influenced my list here, you know, finding old movies that I just haven't, some of them I hadn't heard of or hadn't had access to. So I'm really excited to do this because this is, uh, this is the heart of, of movie lovers, right? Is when you are sitting at home and it's 10 PM and you're like, uh, I'm going to watch a film and <clears throat> you you pick it for you. You pick it for nothing else. It's not a recommendation that someone gave you. It's not a thing you have to do to, so you can talk about it. It's just a film you want to watch that you just want to digest and take in. And I'm really excited to do that here. I think this is a good taste of what, what's going to happen on this show is just stuff like this stuff that gets us excited that we're watching now, even if it is something that's older, uh, always pick, always bringing up what's influencing you now as a movie lover. Um, and I think these five for me represent a lot of what I felt this past year that movies that I kind of held on to during such a tough year in 2020. Well said, man. Yeah, this is definitely the bread and butter of why we do this. Discovering new films that we adore is an amazing feeling, and we're trying to pretty much capture that on the sneak preview. And I think this is a great way to start. Yeah, man. Um, So we're obviously going to go five, four, three, two, one. I'll start so you can finish us off. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna take us to the to the 70s here. Uh, this would be a an animated film <clears throat> called Fantastic Planet. It's a French animated film that I stumbled upon on Criteria, and it just kind of had the poster that popped and just threw it on. It's an hour and 12 minutes. Threw it on, directed by Rene Lalou, and it's a uh, you know general plot is it's on a faraway planet where blue giants rule (laughs) oppressed humanoids rebel again so you have little tiny humans basically that are being you know being controlled and being you know by giant alien like blue monsters and what i find to be so interesting about it is mainly mainly the 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 animation and the soundtrack, the soundtrack is by a gentleman. I, I don't know how to properly say his name. It's Elaine Gorjo, I think is how you say it. Uh, just a f- some fascinating sounds happening in this movie. And then with the, the colors that you're seeing on the screen, it's just a great pairing. But then when you look a little bit deeper, the story is quite frightening at times. And I don't want to say too much about these movies because I really want people to go watch them. Um, that's the same. That's that's how I'm going to feel about a lot of the 2020 films we're going to talk about. I really want people to go see them, go find them, uh, and I I highly highly recommend Fantastic Planet for for people who love animated movies because it's a first off it's French and it's nice to watch an animated movie in a different language. It's also from the 70s, you know, when you're not used to watching something that's from that era that isn't Disney. You know, it's a, it, it totally changes your palate and gives you a different look at, oh, there was other kinds of, you know, cartoons and animation happening in, in just a completely different style. Uh, I, yeah, I, I love it very much. I don't know if it's still on Criterion, but I know you can rent it on Amazon Prime for $2.99 right now. So definitely recommend it from 1973, Renee Lalu's Fantastic Planet. All right, right on. Yeah, I, I doubt, I don't think I've seen any of your five. I, I would bet I haven't. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. Maybe. <laughs> but I know that you've, se- I think you've seen all but one of my five. All right. Let's dig in. <laughs> um, I know that my number five, you are absolutely going to adore because it's one of your favorite movies. 
And it's a film that I got to watch for the first time, uh, thanks to my ongoing mission to wipe out my Netflix list. Uh, actually, three of the films on this list came from that. Hell yeah. It's 1990, what was it, 99, I believe? Let me confirm that. <laughs> um, oh, Tens my mistake. Needles. 1998, Rounders. Oh, okay. I figured. <laughs> yeah, 98. <laughs> so, Rounders stars uh, Matt Damon and Edward Norton as master poker players. Matt Damon was the best, got out of the business. Edward Norton never stopped. And he racks up quite a big debt, and only Matt Damon can expunge that debt for him. And in order to do that, they have to take advantage of their mad skills. And it is a wildly entertaining get- movie. It made me look at poker in a whole new light. And, you know, I'm a big fan of, you know, poker scenes, like gambling scenes in films. Like, I think the poker scenes in Casino Royale are some of my favorite moments. The poker scenes in Rounders put that film to shame. <laughs> and I was so <laughs> happy to finally see this. I immediately bought it as, as I was as I saw it. It's, yeah, it's a it's a it's a fantastic film. Yeah, I, I nothing to say here. It's just a ten out of ten, absolute mind melter. Beautiful movie, love it so much. Maybe one of Edward Norton's like top top performances. It's it's my favorite, but I think it's one of his top top performances. Oh hell yeah, for sure. I think Matt Damon is fantastic and i love malkovich as this sleazy russian gangster it's it's great <laughs> yeah yeah for sure worm, worm edward norton as worm is so good but everything around it is is just and matt damon is kind of carrying this this film when he's normally uh you know playing guys like jason Bourne. so it's cool <laughs> right on hell yeah man that's a great <laughs> that's a good number five jesus christ because if I saw that for the first time, I just I would have a hard time at believing that it wouldn't be one. <laughs> Rounders is the shit. Uh, I would that be filmgasm? Would we do that over there? I guess we'd have to because it was not yeah. it wasn't nominated for anything. No, no, it's one of the yeah, it's one of those badass movies where like they kind of lost money, but who gives a shit? They had a good time and it looks great now. So you and you got a kick ass cast, so so good. Uh, yeah, nineteen ninety eight. So we've had 1973, 1988. Um, I'll go to the 80s here, which I typically don't do. Uh, 80s aren't my favorite decade when you're looking at, you know, the past in cinema. But as I said, I've been on a journey with Criterion, and they have a entire section that's called Black Lives, and it's dedicated to uh, films, short films, uh, documentaries, whatever, whatever. What, what have you all directed and you know written by black people whether it be americans or I, i've watched a movie made by this kenyan woman that was wonderful through that section on criterion but this movie is uh very american right in the heart of you know right in the heart of uh compton watts county uh you have billy woodbury directing and charles burnett writing bless their little hearts from 1983 a fantastic movie that was actually in a section, the Black Lives section, but also in a section where the Safdie brothers give some suggestions on what to watch in Criterion. And this is one of the movies they suggested. And it's very interesting to, you know, watch a movie with the lens we have, right? When you watch so many, so fucking many American movies and English speaking movies, and you just get addicted to these kinds of, you know, things that are happening. And you just kind of miss some of those diamonds, right? Diamonds in the rough. Those, those, those American classics that people don't know are classics yet. And I think Bless Their Little Hearts fits in that category. I think the people who have seen it see it as, you know, the general public sees Kramer versus Kramer. is like, it's just amazing. It's just incredible stuff. And I very much, I'm in that boat now. And, I'm, you know, I think people, you know, there's, there's movies that people should see, need to see, whatever you want to call it. I, I think Bless Little Hearts Arsenal also fits in that category. I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a good, good perspective to have. I think watching a filmmaker like Billy, Billy Woodbury working with a guy like Charles Burnett at the same time in the 80s, is, is, it's a cool, cool place to be. I, 
definitely suggest kind of checking that out. And um, it's really just about, about a family. That's all I can say. You know, it's uh, that's, that is the movie. That's, that's the, just, that's kind of why I brought up Kramer's Kramer is it's within the family. That's what's going on in the film. So bless their little hearts, 1983. That's my, that's my fourth uh, favorite movie that I watched for the first time in 2020. Right on. Yeah. I remember when you reviewed that you were very touched and I can always tell when you watch a film that you really, that really spoke to you just because the way you bring it, like the way you talk about it to me, I can always feel your excitement. And that's always really cool to see. Yeah. Yeah. Like that, that film touched me with like, there's, there's a scene where his three children, the dad and the three children are, they all want ice cream really bad. And it's just those little things that happen when the dad is, you know, there's not quite enough. So he's got to divvy it up in the right way, you know, so that all the kids can eat it. These, these like little things um, in this movie, these touches and bless the little hearts where this dad is just trying to fucking figure some shit out. And he makes some poor decisions and just, it's just honed in it's focused. And I, I, li- I like films like that for sure. And I was touched is definitely a good word. I, I felt very, very touched and moved by, by this one. Right on, man. I felt very touched and moved by my number four pick. Uh, so to put this in perspective for you guys, I tallied all the films I, wa- I watched and reviewed for 2020. <laughs> and the number I reached was 342. <laughs> That's including yeah. first time watches, uh, 2020 films and podcast prep. So I watched a lot of films this year. And my number four was a film that was never on my list that I ended up watching completely by fate. Um, we did this thing for Christmas at my house where we drew from a lot of 50 Christmas movies and watched whatever we came up with that day. And the film we came up with in this instance is 1947's The Bishop's Wife. Oh, okay. Starring Cary Grant and David Niven. It is a hilarious, touching, thoughtful shameless ripoff of it's a wonderful life but it is so touching Cary grant plays an angel who is sent to help this priest who is having a crisis of faith and he it Cary grant is the nicest person on the planet everybody feels warmer around him he helps everybody he the friends a taxi driver who goes ice skating with him it's like it's just so nice it's a sweet movie and it's cool to see a film that is just so impactful on my family because my grandma has been talking about this film for such a long time. She'd been trying to get my family to kind of put it on for years. And in the past, I've been pretty picky about what I watched prior to this podcast. Thank God I threw that out the window. And we ended up getting this film entirely by a random pick. And she was so excited and she finally showed us the Bishop's wife and I adored it. And I'm going to be watching this every Christmas from here on out. It is such a touching, sweet, unforgettable movie. Man, I love that. I was not expecting that one, but I do remember you mentioning that to me. And that's, that's really cool, right? Uh, we've talked a lot about how you and I have both kind of just broken down barrier after barrier as viewers, as consumers of this, this craft, this art, that this medium that we're obsessed with. And through now two shows now a third one right here we're just going to continue to do that we're going to continue to kind of just go right through that and figure out what we've missed out on and what we really like because when you're not you know when you're not exposed to it and you have no idea ah that's the best feeling (laughs) that's the best feeling and 40s movies of course when you're young and you're like no you know it's boring and as you get older you start to just kind of appreciate again appreciate the medium more and that, that stuff becomes really special. So cool. So cool to go back to, to a decade like that uh, for, for your, that was your fourth. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> this is great. Um, so you watched the first one was a Netflix one. And then that one's one of your Christmas. Okay. All right. Uh, my third one here is um, I, I think, you know, this is going to be on here. I think you had it. Yeah. I think you had a good feeling. I just right away within you know, halfway through the film, I knew this was kind of a 10 out of 10 kind of movie for me. It's a a film I've been meaning to watch for so long since I saw Gravity, probably. It's Alfonso Cuaron's 
Y Tu Mamba Tambien from 2001. Uh, the, it's hard to talk about E2 without, you know, again, without digging into the, the plot because the plot is a couple of, couple of buddies go on a road trip with another woman and things unfold, you know, things happen and people figure out some stuff and have questions. And, you know, there's a pretty impactful ending, pretty impactful finale that uh, I already was kind of blown away by the movie. And then that the ending happens. And if you've seen this one, you, you, you know, you know what I'm talking about, you know, what you, the, the information you find out and it's just, some kind of a mind blowing experience. There's some, there's a little bit of narration going on and it's in the heart of Mexico. It's a Spanish speaking film and you can feel Alfonso Cuaron. You can feel his touch, you know, when you have watched, you know, children of Ben and gravity and Roma, what have you, this guy is just a, a Titan from the past couple, couple decades. And I was very glad to finally go back and watch this. And then, uh, you found it on DVD and bought it for me. So now I, ha now I own it and it's a, it's a rough film, but it makes me smile. It really does. I, I'll, I'll never forget the first time I, I watched any of these, but really E2 was, was special. It's um, I, I actually, I'll, I'll be honest here. You know, I got to give it to Barry Jenkins for this one because while I knew this was something I needed to see, it was when I was scrolling through criterion and saw, on Barry Jenkins, he had that as one of his suggestions. And I was like, all right, that's it. I got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I knew I needed to do it. I knew, you know, I knew I had to finally see it. And that just gave me that push. And I'll, I'll never forget it, man. I love you too. It's got a really, really cool, two, well, two performances that I think are really cool from fuck it three, all three of the main, <laughs> all three of the main people, which is Diego Luna, Gail Garcia Bernal, and Ana Lopez Mercado. All three of them are wonderful, but, but, but personally, Diego Luna, she, she like sh shook me. She shook me to my core. And I, 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 you know, watching him kind of as a really young guy, you know, and then seeing him in fucking Star Wars, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very bizarre to see that ride when, you know, you kind of didn't know about it or didn't know that he had those, those traps at, at that age. Uh, yeah, Itu Mama Tembien, 2001. Alfonso Cuaron, I, I just, yeah, highly, highly suggest that one. It is, a, you know, it is um, quite sexual. So if you don't, you know, if that's not your bag, probably shouldn't go near it. But uh, yeah, it's a good, 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 good film. And Connor, I can't wait for you to see it. I've seen a good chunk of Cuaron's movies, but yeah, his early work I've yet to really tap into. And I think that would be a great uh, Oscar Sunday. <laughs> oh, it will be. Yeah, it will be. <laughs> One day for sure. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah, I remember when all these reviews came in. It's cool to kind of go back to what we've been up to this past year. Well, there, yeah, all, all five of these movies are, are tens for me. You know, I, I've, I've found enough movies that were new that I really adored this year because I was just really trying to branch out. And I, I felt like I could pick five, five tens and I, I went for it. I was unable. I have one eight and four nines. <laughs> It's tens are incredibly rare for me. Like really yeah. rare. You usually have to see a film twice to give it a to give it a 10. And I I yeah. give a lot of first time movies a 10. Yeah. I'm I've only given in. I only gave one first time 10 this year, and it was Judgment at Judgment Nuremberg. at Nuremberg. Yep. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> and that was that was prep for Judy Garland. So yep, so it's not here. <laughs> it doesn't count. Yeah. Yeah. I oh, bring that, that film a, up a lot. <laughs> that's a whole different conversation. Um that's 1961, correct? Yeah. Just hypothetical here. For Oscar Sunday, would you rather do that or The Hustler? Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Sophie's Choice right there. Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just for fun. Oh. Just for shits and gigs. Shit, I'm going to have to get back to you on that. Because both of those would be phenomenal episodes. They would be. They would be. Um, neither of them won. Right? So, you know. Yeah, the winner was fucking west side story which we just do not like over here i'm not a not a fan especially compared to those two yikes i hate when that happens when the winner is some dog shit and the nominees are masterpieces <laughs> <laughs> oh man ah. so 
my number three is another movie that you adore and had been trying to get me to check out for quite a while. And it came up on my Netflix uh, random list. And it's a film that I remember seeing the trailer for back in 2012 when it, when it came out. And I thought it looked stupid. I thought it looked generic, cheesy, pointless. And then I watched it and I could not fucking believe it. It is end of watch 2012. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, oh man. Jake Gyllenhaal and Michael Pena as cops in LA, you know, cruising the beat, get into some dark shit, end up targeted by the cartel. And it's all found footage, which is so bizarre for an action movie. You don't see that very often outside of horror. And it's David Ayer at his best. Like, yes. I didn't like him because of Suicide Squad, but admittedly, not his fault. And then, you know, I watched Fury, thought that was great. So, I, end of watch proved to me that this guy really is, you know, a talented filmmaker. And another film I went out and bought, it's just killer. End of Watch is one of the most tense action thrillers I've seen in years. And Jake Gyllenhaal and Michael Pena are fucking phenomenal um, I know most of their dialogue is improvised. Like they just kind of had natural chemistry they developed over the course of filming and uh, preparation. And a lot of that film just made up on the fly and just them talking to each other in character. And that is amazing because it, it feels so organic and you just believe the, the dynamic between these guys. And the ending is such a out of left field, like, you know, pull the rug out from under you type of thing, but it works. And yeah, I couldn't say enough great things about end of watch. Yeah. Hey, I got Liberace's AK. <laughs> mm. Yeah, man. I, I love End of Watch. I saw that in theaters in College Station with my oldest brother. And I just kind of fell in love right away. You know, you know me though. I'm kind of just I've just been a sucker for Jake Jalen Hall for for a long time. Uh since I first, you know, saw Donnie Darko, probably it was when I was like, uh-oh, this guy. This guy's my hero, you know, and he's continued to just make awesome decisions, you know, throughout this past decade, you know, with End of Watch and Enemy and Prisoners in 2012 and 2013 and on to Nightcrawler in 2014. I, I love the guy. I think he, you know, played this cop that I actually kind of, kind of liked, you know, and I kind of like dug sort of what's going on there, you know, in the same way that I dig what Ethan Hawke's doing in training day kind of thing. Like, ah, oh, you know, there's people out there trying to do some, some stuff. And, and uh, there's some, the, uh, to talk about the found footage thing, there's there, that angle to, to me is just going to, is going to do it, do it well. I think in the long run, it's going to make it age well in the way that it's just purely different in the way that it, kind of shocks you with certain things. You know, if you have a, a character who just kind of walks by right here by the camera with, you know, their fucking eye is gouged out, you know, yeah. shit like that. Shit like that is, is really effective in, in a, a police movie, a cop movie with, uh, you know, these gangster characters and then different things unfolding. End of Watch is, is awesome. I think it's a, a movie that has a lot of conversation to be had around it. Absolutely. And I, I might, like the coolest thing about it is that these two guys are really good cops. Like there's no, you know, accidental executions. Like they are very careful about everything they do. And I like that. You don't see that a lot in the news these days. It's, it's nice. Yeah. To just, yeah. yeah. Have two heroes you can root for in a, in a cop film like this. Yeah, man. Yeah. Awesome. That's, that's good. That's cool to see there. And that, that was through Netflix as well. You got that and then you bought it. Yes. <laughs> okay. Very nice, very nice. So that, that was your third. We're on to the the top two here. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go just a year before uh, end of watch. So we're going to 2011. Ah, oh boy. You know, I haven't seen. There's there's some movies from countries that you know that that I haven't seen. There's nations I haven't covered, right? And I, I want to do that. I want to see films from different countries in Africa, different countries in Asia, different countries in, in Europe. And of course, you know, seen a lot of French stuff, you know, seen, you know, you know what I mean? There's the, there's the popular countries that Italian, but Iran is not a place I've gone to before. And uh, a separation from 2011. This is a film that got some buzz at the Oscars and uh, it's written and directed by Asghar Farhadi. 
and you know has two performances by Payman, Madi, and I don't know how to say the name, Leila Hatami. I think that's how you say it. These are just mind-boggling performances in this in this movie. That's really what I what I mainly fell in love with. What I held on to mostly was at, at the heart of it. These two people who, of course, a separation. You can guess what it's about. Um, what what I'll say is, you know, if you you put Marriage Story in one place and then a separation would be like fucking checkmate. You know, here's here's a movie that really again hones in and focuses and that's the kind of i'm seeing a pattern in what i have here it really focuses in on something and does not let go and stays inside the the flat that they live in and that the dad is in mostly that'd be nadir and that'd be payman madi's character uh he's he's in this flat so much of the film and you you really are forced to either be comfortable or uncomfortable you know it doesn't matter you're kind of along for the ride and you just witness these actions and conversations that are, uh, yeah, almost too authentic, too real. It's kind of what I said about uh, Pixar when we were talking about Shrek on Oscar Sunday. Uh, just sometimes gets too real. And a separation, <laughs> much different movie than the Pixar stuff. A separation is is very authentic, very something that's you know it's going to shatter you. You know, it's. You kind of go into it, going in, go into it, knowing that. And I, you know, I put this movie off for a long time, right? Uh, just the title of it is like, ah, do I really want to watch a, you know, two-hour drama called A Separation? You know, shit. Uh, you know, about a year, less than a year and a half ago, you know, I would say, yeah, somewhere in there, year, year and a half ago, my my parents separated. And so this is a movie I wanted, I've wanted to watch since it came out, since I knew about it's, you know, winning, it's winning at the Oscar best foreign language film. I'd wanted to see it right this whole decade, but I just never got around to it. And then for personal reasons, you know, I was just like, I don't know if I want to go down that road, you know, I don't really know exactly what this is about. Do I really want to want to watch a movie? And, but I think confronting stuff like that is partly what art is about, you know, is, is, I don't want to say use art, but if, if art is there for you to, to consume and you're going through something, maybe, maybe it can help you, you know, maybe it can help you see some sort of perspective or maybe it can just take your mind off things. Who knows? And a separation just when I thought it was kind of going to make me break down, it kind of, it kind of, it shattered me, but it shattered me in a good way, man. It made me a certain, you know, people are people, man. People make decisions. People say things. People do things, and it's it's hard being a person. And a separation just kind of puts that shit on a platter for you. And I, I, I'm very thankful for movies like that. And 2011 is like a really hard year for me to pick a favorite movie because I've always thought it was Moneyball, but now a separation <laughs> kind of rivals it, and that that's tough. <laughs> so yeah I, that's that's my second favorite it was is almost my first favorite uh another 10 out of 10 movie that i i've i've rewatched scenes already since i since i've seen it i think i watched it back in maybe june or july sometime in the summer i think i watched it uh yeah i i love a separation so much and again i want to watch more iranian movies you know that's it's on me it's on you know it's on the the viewer it's on the consumer to branch out and check, check shit out, you know? Uh, and that's, that's part of my journey is definitely trying to see things that aren't just from the perspective I'm used to. And that's, this movie did that for me. Films certainly have a lot more power than I think most people give them credit for. I think certain types of films can break us. Certain types of films can elevate us. And it's really incredible that you forged a connection with this film from Iran. Like that is, that's amazing. And I know that of the bunch that you sent me this, uh, this past year, a separation was at the top of like films that I knew I would want to see. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I think uh, it again, just like E2, it's a movie that will, will probably come up on Oscar Sunday and we'll, we'll get a good, good long conversation out of, out of the, both of those. Yeah, that's mostly why I haven't really sought it out because I knew you were going to put that on the schedule at some point. Yeah, 
Yeah. I want to save my first time reaction for the show. Always, right? If you can, if you know it's going to come. That's the thing, right? <laughs> About this journey, too, is I know you and I have had a few conversations where we're like, holy shit, I didn't realize how much I didn't know. <laughs> And you, because if you dive deeper and you dive deeper and you dive deeper, there's more and more and more, more doors open, more doors open. And holy shit, you realize how much, I, you know, there's so much out there. It's not just what I've been, you know, exposed to my, my, and during my life, but there's a lot out there. And that's, I, I know you and I have, have taken to just, just watch, watch stuff, do it, do it, do it. Just take it in, take it in, put it on. You never know what's going to happen. You never know. If you're going to be blown away by something, if you're going to catch something you really like, some music you enjoy, performance you like, and that's you know that's the art of being a cinephile. <laughs> it's just consume it, watch it, have fun with it, and sometimes you get gold out of it. <laughs> yeah. And that's very much how I felt about separation: is you just, just dig and dig and dig, and and for you and myself, we know there's stuff that's going to come up on these shows, so we can dig elsewhere, <laughs> <laughs> and that's a cool feeling. 342 films, man. That's, you know, 342 opportunities to find something new. That's 342 possible masterpieces that I never would have known about had I not taken the plunge to see these films. Granted, not all of them were. Most of them sucked. But that's, you know, that's the game we play. <laughs> that, is, that is definitely the game we play. Yeah, <laughs> it is every day. <laughs> uh, it is great. to Yeah, that's fantastic, man. It's great. It's beautiful. My number two is a lot less, uh, a lot more underwhelming, but it is a film I watched early in 2020. Um, one of the films that kind of started my Netflix binge thing. Um, it's one that I had been putting off for quite some time and I didn't know I'd like it as much as I did. It's 2009's Up in the Air. Oh, <laughs> all right. Okay. George Clooney, Vera Farmiga, and Anna Kendrick in a film that's basically just about work travel and how it's like a substitute for some people's lives. And no, you know, my mom had a, uh, before COVID, she would do a lot of business trips and she told me like, yeah, that's pretty much exactly what it's like. People hook up at the conventions, people have their, you know, their uh, rituals at the airport. And it's, it's so weird because I've never been in that world. I worked in corporate briefly, but I never had to take a business trip. I almost did before COVID hit. I was going to spend three weeks in Nebraska. <laughs> God, that would have been a fucking nightmare. Um, yeah, work at, work at the Cinnabon. <laughs> yeah, change my name to Gene. Um, <laughs> but the reason Up in the Air made my number two slot is because of one scene in particular. And it's a big spoiler, so I'll be kind of vague, but it's the scene where Clooney's character realizes exactly what has been going on between him and Vera Farmiga this whole time. And it is such a heartbreaking scene because of how you've gotten to know Clooney over the course of this film. He's a cynic. He hates life, but he's charming and he's willing to try. But this breaks him to the point where he's just he's he's gone. And it's done so well, and the performances are so fantastic, and I really, really like Jason Reitman's eye for directing, and I'm excited to see him take on Ghostbusters. So yeah, up in the air, fantastic dramedy that I highly recommend. I also went out and bought it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I totally understand that. Jason Reitman, I remember, I, I think I wrote a review for Juno earlier in the year. Uh, thank you for smoking. Yeah, this guy, pretty crazy filmography and up in the air is, is, is probably my favorite. And Clooney and Farmiga, that right there is, who would have thought, right? You know, that's, that's another, another thing we just kind of point out. You just keep watching movies, keep watching movies. And occasionally you find these like, whoa, look at that pairing. That's, that actually works. Holy shit. Um, I love that. I love that part of, of movie watching and up in the air is definitely a movie that I knew you would like even before, you know, and the scene with JK Simmons, you know, there's, there's a big one there. Um, big scene with him and it cracks me the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> he he's, he's pretty great. Um, Cause you know, George Clooney, George Clooney's job is to essentially you know, yeah. can people. So he's the firer. He's, he goes to yeah. places and he, 
fires people for the bosses who can't bring themselves to do it. And my grandma did that. My grandma was, uh, she would fire people on behalf of other people in the government because some people didn't have the balls to do it themselves. So they called my grandma. I was like, Elise, can you can you fire this guy for me? She's like, yeah. <laughs> Let's so do it. It's Yeah, it's crazy that that's a, that's a career some people can have where they literally just go to places and fire other people. And I liked how this movie kind of showed you the emotional toll that can take on somebody. You know, always being the bearer of bad news can mess up your life, can make you a very negative person. And sometimes you need a spark to reignite any kind of embers you have left. And yeah, I thought that movie did it great. Uh, yeah, great pick, great pick. I, I, I didn't think about that one. I kind of forgot that you saw that for the first time. Uh, yeah, that was like mid-January or something, but it counts. <laughs> crazy, crazy. Uh, on to the number ones, huh? Uh, this, is, this has been fun, man. And, you know, of course, we have another list to get to here, but uh, this, this, this film here uh, would obviously be my favorite that I've rewatched, or not rewatched, seen for the first time that isn't 2020 and be going to my favorite decade, the 70s, of course, 1979, Camera Buff, uh-huh. a, a Polish film here directed by, written and directed by Krzysztof Kislowski. And uh, it's about this man named Philip who buys a camera. <clears throat> and he's the first person in his town to own a camera essentially. And so that comes with, you know, his own, his own obsessions with the camera, but it also comes with people wanting to use the camera, right? Of course, cause he has it and opens up this whole, whole thing in his life that he didn't have before and kind of turns him into something that, uh, that I think maybe all, you know, movie people kind of fear. You just be, you just kind of become obsessed and kind of, you know, you're not really in reality anymore. You're just kind of thinking about that one thing and creating and creating and filming and finding the right angles without kind of living the rest of your life sort of thing. And the movie kind of, I think plays with, with that idea and plays with the idea of the director and the the creator and how dangerous it can be sometimes to become obsessed with the work where the work becomes your life. And I've always loved that. Right. I've always loved that idea. And even the, you know, if you look at the movie poster for camera buff, it's the main character, Philip with a camera lens as his head. It's a very, very interesting poster. And of course that intrigued me. Um, and I also watched it because it's also on criterion. Of course, all five films are that I watched <laughs> that I chose here. Um, it was also another one that the, the Safdie brothers suggested camera buff and the way they talked about it, you know, I have no problem being up, bringing up the way they talked about it because they said something. Um, it was, it was Josh who said it, the older one, he said, um, with camera buff, you know, it's, you know, kind of breaks down, you know, filmmaking and how it's, you know, one of the most, you know, kind of perverse things you can do, right? You know, when you just film somebody doing something, how just when you just break it down as a human being, how strange it is, but how, you know, and this is, this is what, you know, Mr. Josh Safty is saying, he says, it's, it's, it's the most awesome thing in the world, you know, film, filming, filmmaking, movie making, and watching them, consuming them while you understand. And I, I, I related to that very much. And while watching camera buff, I very much related related to that kind of topic, that kind of idea of it is, you you can see how this, this craft, this medium is so dangerous, right. For some minds to go down and while you want it to be this beautiful thing that uplifts people and tells good stories, it, it quite often doesn't go down that road. Quite often it gets, it gets snarky. It gets dangerous. It gets, you know, people get, you know, get selfish, you know, and get egotistical and all these things come into play. And I think camera buff kind of put that into this focused movie about a guy living in Poland who has the one camera in his town and it's a two hour movie. And I just was kind of blown away that it kind of put all of those emotions and that kind of idea and those topics and those thoughts into a film about this guy, Philip, who just buys a camera, just a guy in a camera. 
you know, it all starts with that. And that's what movies are, right? It all starts. It's got it. You got to have a guy and a camera because <laughs> quite frankly, you can have a movie with no people, but you got to have a guy and a camera. <laughs> and I thinking about that part, why, why do we do this? Why do we just watch so much shit? Cause we fucking love it. There's no other answer. There's no other answer. We, we love it. We love the feeling that it occasionally gives us. And we want to, we want to chase after that. We want to have fun with that. And I, I don't really have any other answer, but it's a fun fucking thing to talk about and think about. Damn. That is, yeah, it is. It's a rush. It's an emotional rush and it's very hard to find films that can capture that rush, but you constantly look for them just because you want to experience it again. You felt it once you need to feel it a million times. Yeah. Yeah. And I just did. I just did. Um, you know, we have Chinatown coming up on our, our next Oscar Sunday. Obviously can't wait to do that. And I've we've seen that a few times. <laughs> Watched on Criterion for the first time, uh, a woman under the influence directed by John Cassavetes. Just blown away by that film. And that it kind of gave me that like, vroom, that burst where like the hairs on your neck kind of go up and you just want more. And I, that, that is the best feeling. <laughs> It is, yeah, it's surreal, and it's uh, it's why we're here. You know, it's why we have three podcasts. It's yeah, yeah, capturing that feeling and getting to talk about it at length and kind of uncover why it is that we have that reaction to stuff like this. It's, it's amazing. It's so much fun. I'm so glad that we get to do this. And yeah, sometimes it fails. You know, sometimes there are films we watch that just didn't do anything for us, and that's the worst. But it's never going to deter me from stopping. Because I know there's a masterpiece right around the corner at all times. I just have to find oh, yeah. it. Oh, yeah. It's there. They're there. They are there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so cool. Oh. What's your number one, man? My number one, uh, weirdly enough, is also a film that deals with obsession, but a different kind of obsession. Um, it's a film that I wanted to watch simply because there was a documentary about it that I wanted to watch. But I did not expect this film to absolutely blow me away. And it is 1999's Man on the Moon. Oh, yes. Starring the most mind-blowingly insane performance Jim Carrey has ever given as crazy, possibly psychotic, hilarious, maybe still alive, dead comedian Andy Kaufman. The most complicated human being who ever entered Hollywood. And this is his story. And it's such an insane story. But more insane than that is the are the lengths Jim Carrey went to become Kaufman. And there's a whole documentary called Jim and Andy about this transformation. And Jim Carrey essentially erased his own personality to become Andy Kaufman for the duration of filming. And then afterwards had difficulty becoming Jim Carrey again. And I am certain this, you know, stayed with him. This transformation messed him up psychologically to the point where he was never really the same again. It's a very interesting look at just how far one can take acting. And Man on the Moon, I think, is the film that Jim Carrey should have won Best Actor for. I think it's a crime he's never been nominated. And it's such a phenomenal watch. It's such a strange movie. And even like in the end of it, you're still not sure. Like Andy Kaufman like, could be, if anybody could fake their own death, it's him. <laughs> and... He might have just, you know, gotten tired of Hollywood and just, you know, fake died and showed up in, you know, Eastern Europe somewhere as a truck driver or some shit. He was that crazy. <laughs> he would do that and never bring it up. And I knew nothing about Andy Kaufman going into this. And now I am obsessed with this guy. <laughs> it's the that, it's a wild story. And Carrie's performance it. is absolutely unforgettable. Check out the documentary. It's a great double feature. Uh the documentary is on Netflix. The movie is not. I got this one through Netflix in the mail, which I still do. And it was an entirely random pick. Sometimes, you know, I'll just like close my eyes and go through the list. And then whatever my cursor lands on, I throw that to the top of the list. And Man on the Moon was one that I got. <laughs> and here it is. the My favorite film that I saw unprompted this year. <laughs> oh, man. So good. That. You, you, what you just said about how you didn't know anything about Kaufman or didn't, you know, or knew the name, but didn't know much about the, the life. 
And now you do. Because of a movie. Because of a goddamn movie. <laughs> That's just, what it's that, all about. A That's goddamn all about. movie that got like kind of mediocre attention and didn't really make any waves despite everything Carrie poured into it. And yeah. I think that it's time to revisit that film. Because, I mean, just the fact that he like became... Andy Kaufman like he didn't act as Andy Kaufman he, he I truly believe he became Andy Kaufman yeah it's frightening <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's 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 one of the things we fall in love with is that that kind of performance is so so awesome and refreshing to just be able to watch you know and you you appreciate all the hard work it took to get there from from Jim Jesus phenomenal that was that was great uh it's god it's been so long since we did a like a countdown <laughs> yeah yeah i know it's it's a lot of fun man it's a lot of fun to be able to talk about shit that you've you've enjoyed over the past months or year or you know just something that you can kind of attach to yourself as hey i really enjoy this it's fun before we get to the main course let's recap the appetizer what was your top five my top five starting with 1973's fantastic planet number four 1983's Bless Their Little Hearts. Number three, 2001's E Tu Mama Tambien. Number two, A Separation. And number one, 1979, Camera Buff. Very nice. Very yeah, wild top five. Like, <laughs> I, I don't think anyone who's listened to our show like knows any of those films, and I really hope they seek them out. <laughs> We got we got a French animated movie. We got a we got an American movie here. We got a Mexican movie, Iranian and Polish. Yeah, wonderful. Hell yeah. Uh, my top five: number five, 1998's Rounders; number four, 1947's The Bishop's Wife; number three, 2012's End of Watch; number two, 2009's Up in the Air; and number one, 1999's Man on the Moon. There it Fuck is. Yeah. <laughs> beautiful stuff yeah expect more top fives in the future on this show uh doing doing shit like that where you just bounce off fun stuff absolutely it's going to be the best i have a feeling this is going to be my favorite one <laughs> <laughs> good shit so 2020 not the best year for pretty much anybody uh film buffs especially have had difficulty finding stuff to watch this year uh, new stuff. Usually uh, around this time, we would do the Gazzies, the Filmgasm Awards, which is our yearly celebration of the past year in film. We give awards, we do categories, we basically mimic the Oscars with our own categories. But due to the nature of films this year, uh, us not being able to really see the same films, we decided to postpone the Gazzies till 2022 and do our own kind of, you know, substitute. And that's where we came up with the top 10. So I think this is going to work out just fine. Get us, give us both a chance to talk about films that the other might not have gotten to watch and embrace it. Yeah. See where, see where they lie. Okay. So let's dig into our top 10 of 2020. Uh, why don't you do the honors? Yes. I'll start so you can finish off again here, just like we do at the top fives. Um, man, this is going to be fun. Like you said, 2020 was weird. You've seen a lot more movies from 2020 than I have, but I did a lot of homework during December to kind of crunch in some stuff. Yeah. Some stuff I have, some stuff I haven't even talked to you about, which is like really hard to do. <laughs> like, oh, I want you know, I'm trying to keep it fresh for the show here. Uh, but this is a film that you have seen and I have seen. Just came out on Christmas Day, and that is Disney Pixar's Soul. Oh. That's my tenth favorite film of 2020. Um, immediately. <clears throat> I was, you know, completely blown away by, of course, the animation, just like Pixar does always, and bringing New York to life in the way they did. They typically use um, easier stuff to me. The ocean, you know, the, you know, uh, other, other films, you know, Toy Story, they're using a bunch of toys. Bugs Life, they're using, yeah, the outside sort of thing, Monsters, Inc. Using New York City, very unique thing to do for for Pixar and to really hone in on the city, and you got you got this awesome character that Jamie Foxx is playing, Joe Gardner. I I really 
really dug this. I've only seen it once. I want to rewatch it again. I want to really try to confront some of the ideas that they're, they're putting out there. Cause I think, I think it's pretty complex. I think it's what's going on. I, I don't think it's a typical kids movie, right? Kind of like inside out. It's really, you know, inside outs, you know, about emotions and feelings and soul, I guess would be about how you live, you know, how you choose to handle those and live with them, you know, and, that's not easy stuff to digest. Right. But as an adult, I love when an animated movie plays with those ideas, plays with those questions. And I thought soul was spectacular from the little touch of Charles Mingus being the ringtone for Joe to, you know, the wacky Tina Fey 22 character, everything kind of worked for me on this one. Uh, I know a lot of people have kind of given the, uh, you know, middle part of the film where he goes into the, you know, into the cat, I think people have, you know, been upset with that one, but uh, yeah, no, I think, I think, I think soul is really good all, all the way through. And I, you had texted me, you know, is in your top 10 and I was like, yeah, for sure. It almost got pushed out, <laughs> <laughs> but it's here. It's here. And it, it beat out some, some films I really enjoy. And I'm, I'm glad to start it here with a kids slash adult uh, animated movie. Soul. <laughs> soul. Uh, it didn't crack my top 10, but it was very, very good. And, uh, beautifully beautifully animated i was very yeah. impressed with that um i love the whole concept the way it kind of like talks about the afterlife and really like the before life whatever you want to call it yeah the jerry's and, yeah the jerry's is it's very sweet and i can see this being used like much like inside out is used to kind of help kids you know identify their emotions i can see this film being used as a way to help kids kind of deal with death and that's cool and i appreciate you know pixar is constantly topping themselves and it's really the only place we're getting original ideas from disney uh and i'll always love them for that most of their films tend to follow a you know what if blank had feelings template uh but you know i like that <laughs> same same i think it's great and I think it'd be a mistake to not bring up uh, before we move on to your number 10, Pete doctor real quick. He's, he's the creative, you know, the head, head creative director at, uh, at Pixar and occasionally directs. <clears throat> and we, we brought this up and we talked about monsters Inc, you know, and in inside out and, and stuff over on Oscar Sunday when we did our Shrek episode, because we were talking a bunch about animated movies and Pete doctor is just kind of like, as far as the past couple of decades, he's, he's probably the best. Uh, doing Monsters Inc., Up, Inside Out, and Soul. You know, these are heavy hitters. That's a really nice little filmography filmography to have within, you know, just those just those Pixar films. So I, I think he's someone who's consistently trying, you know, really trying to do some stuff and push some things. And uh, you got Kent Powers. I as far as I know, it's the first black guy that they've gotten to work on one of these films. And it shows in soul, man, you got a really cool perspective on, on this, on this film, uh, you know, where you can see where it maybe lacks in other ones. And, and with soul, you can just see how there's, you know, it's not just one voice at the front here or at the top, you know, Pixar is definitely trying to share different kinds of stories and from Coco to now soul. I'm just, I'm really impressed with what they're, what they're capable of doing, what they're trying to do. Same. Yeah. I'll, I, I rarely feel like I'm about to watch a piece of shit when I watch a Pixar movie. Most of the time, yeah, I'm no. like, I'm probably going to cry my eyes out and think about this movie every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's happened quite a few times with Pixar. Soul is one I definitely would like to watch again. Um, it didn't feel like a kid's movie. Like, it felt very much like a grown-up film about, you know, wasting your life. And, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> wild yeah what's your number 10 my number 10 is one i'm fairly certain is going to be higher up on your list <laughs> that's fair it is the amazon original sound of metal <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's my number two yeah god damn <laughs> well sorry to be into climactic no, there. you're good you're good that's fine shit um this was a film i was not gonna watch i just I, I saw like part of a trailer and I just like, I have other things I want to do. 
and I think you you watched it and said it was amazing. And I was like, well, fuck it. All right. And I watched it and I was like, this is, this is great. I was like, this is really good. Completely changed my mind on Riz Ahmed. I thought he was good, but holy shit is he lights out in this movie. <laughs> Same with yeah, Olivia Cook. Yeah. Like, she's becoming one of my favorite actresses. Every role I see Olivia Cook in, I'm like, she's fucking great. And yeah, just the idea of a heavy metal drummer losing his hearing and just sh- his whole life shattering because of that is such a brilliant concept. And it's done so well. Oh, yeah. Couldn't say enough great things about this one. Yeah, I can. I'll, I'll save. I'll save my thoughts for for later down the line. It's definitely, definitely one that kind of kind of broke me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, that's that's a good one. I I have a feeling this will be on yours. <laughs> my my number nine. That would be Justice League Dark. <laughs> <laughs> that is my number three. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, there you go. You know, we just did it to each other both. Um, you have so much more knowledge about this movie but i'll give you you have more knowledge about justice league dark is what i'll say because i don't i don't know much about it you know you know it doesn't matter because this movie fucking kicks ass yeah it kicks ass in the way that kill bill kicks ass it kicks ass in the way that infinity war kicks ass think about those at the same time think about think about Characters you love, characters you adore, getting ripped in half, getting just, getting just, just torn apart, and you're just what, wh- what, you know, not her, not him, you know, and just over and over, just people dying and minimum, minimum survival, you know. And when you told me you had you had texted me, Austin, Justice League Dark, if you can get around to this, like do it. But you kind of the way you the way you texted was like I, I probably need to need to get to that one. I probably need to get to that one. It is one of the better animated movies I've seen in the past few years. Let alone just you know I made it here on my top top ten films of 2020, and you know beat Soul out. You know I, I, I'm typically going to go towards the Pixar movie, but not in this case it's there's there's no comparison here uh <laughs> there's no comparison here I, i'm i'm obviously going to let you save your thoughts for it because it's your number three uh you, you again you have more base knowledge of what's going on here but this is a dc powerhouse animated movie that people just should check out i we watched it through voodoo but is it on something right now or no i don't think so but HBO Max has been collecting a lot of these, so I wouldn't be surprised yes. if this is going to be there in a few months. Yeah, yeah, definitely be on the lookout for that, everybody. Uh, Justice League Dark Apocalypse War is what it's, and it's spelled kind of funky, Apocalypse, you yeah. know. So just just search Justice League Dark, you know, it's, it's just fucking awesome. Oh, yeah, I can't wait to talk about that. That movie fucking changed me. <laughs> um, my number nine is the only film uh, well, new release film that we got to see in theaters this year is The Invisible Man. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. Hard to believe that's the same year <laughs> as the rest of these films. Feels like <sighs> eons ago. Yeah, it really does. Really does. Ah, I had such a good time at the theater saying that. Mm-hmm. That was nice. Oh, how little we knew. Um, so The Invisible Man was Blumhouse's first attempt at remaking the classics. And what a great knockout first attempt it was. Lee Winnell, Elizabeth Moss killed it. It is such a freaky movie. The way it played with invisibility, it wasn't, you know, a serum. It was a suit. But it's more a film about abuse and, you know, psychological abuse. And it's such a smart movie. The the visual effects, the stunt work, incredible. Elizabeth Moss's performance is fantastic. And it's creepy. It's scary. I was not expecting that. Like typically, you know, I I've, I've watched the original uh 1933 Invisible Man to prep for this before we went and saw it. And that was good, but not, you know, scary. What's I don't a, a scientist who's invisible is, doesn't seem scary at all. But Adrian Griffin is a monster. The Invisible Man in this movie is a straight up psychopath monster, nightmare of a human being and you are scared of him. It's yeah, yeah, very. I yeah, I, I sing this film's praise. It's one of the best horror films of the year, for surely, surely, and definitely one a film that stands out for the horror community in a year that 
just, you know, didn't, didn't deliver totally. And honestly, 2019 didn't totally deliver. So, you know, pours, pours due for, for a really solid year. Hopefully that's coming soon. Um, Cause 2018 was, 2018 <laughs> was nice. <laughs> we had, we had hereditary and Halloween in like the same three months. So, you know, <laughs> that was different, cool. different times. Uh, good stuff, man. This is, this is, always fun to you know talk about talk about this stuff invisible man is not on my list but uh definitely was one that i thought about it's definitely somewhere in the 10 to 15 range or 11 to 15 range sorry um moving on to number eight here for me that would be a film that came out in 2019 through some fucking festivals and shit but didn't nothing happen with it and then amazon bought it <clears throat> so it's technically an amazon original and then uh, that was released in may of 2020 and that's the vast of night oh yeah <laughs> a a film that kind of kind of blew me away nice little you know mystery sci-fi movie written and directed by andrew patterson a guy that uh, just be on the lookout for that name andrew patterson this movie is a uh, it's just based on one night and um, we're in new mexico in the 1950s and you can guess you can guess what's going on there's some you know some audio frequency vibrations. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's some alien shit, right? And um, what, what's great about The Fast of Night is less is more. It's all about less is more. It's all about practicality because they did not have a lot of money. In fact, Andrew Patterson, even to the finest detail, used, used up all the budget and used up the last little bit to, that they actually filmed this part in Texas, uh, at the gym, there's a gym that's used at the beginning of the film. And he, in the 1950s, there was no three point line. And so when they're walking through the gym and during the scene of the vast of night, there's no three point line because Andrew Patterson spent the last of their budget so that he could get the wood redone so that it would look like a 1950s basketball floor. And wow. that my, my, that my friends is dedication and fill and, and that, that, that's a part of that's a part of the process. It's part of filmmaking. When you're a guy named Andrew Patterson, who nobody nobody really knows about you, those are the kind of things you have to do to stand out. And those are the kind of things you and I, you know, as film lovers, and you know, we notice those things. We care about those things. Those little touches. And I, I'm a huge, huge basketball fan. So when I, I was like, oh man, there's no three point line. That's when I knew it was the '50s. That's when I knew. Well, that's when I knew it was pre late '70s. You know, I knew it was in the fifties or sixties or, or early seventies because not because of, I read anything about it, but because of the basketball court, not having a three point line, that's how I caught it. So those visual cues that that's huge. And then of course, later on, I, you know, I start figuring it out. Okay. It's definitely in New Mexico in the fifties. Okay. But the vast of night is full of these touches and full of incredible editing done by Andrew Patterson himself. He's kind of did it all here as far as crafting this movie. So Still on Amazon Prime, always will be. I, you know, it's an hour and thirty minutes. I really don't think anyone would dislike it. I think it's just an exciting movie, even if you're just it's just kind of a popcorn movie, at least for people. But if you look a little deeper, uh, and and I, I I very much enjoyed it, and I definitely looked pretty deep into this one. I've watched it twice this past year, and I, I typically don't do that with new releases. I don't watch them back to back, but I I did with Vast of Night. I, I really dug it and. Uh, I think Connor, I think you'll really enjoy it. I think it's a movie right up your alley um, with its kind of, with its tone and just subject matter. I think you'll really dig it and uh, an easy one that's on a, a streaming service right now. Hell yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I definitely would like to check that one out. Mm, I love alien shit as you put it. Yeah. Yeah. A, a, alien shit is, is fun. And I like, I like, I think one of my favorite things about alien shit is the, the fear that it instills in people. And that's what the vast of night is playing with. Cause they're, they don't have the money to actually put a bunch of aliens in front of you. <laughs> and, and you, I would rather a movie do that than try too hard. And it look like shit. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. how about you focus in, you know, focus in on characters that are dealing with it, dealing with the fear of a possibility, you know, that's way more interesting to me. I call that the dark skies approach. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the practicality of the John Carpenter approach. Yeah. Absolutely. Nice pick. My number eight uh, was a toss up. And there was just one scene in a particular, in this particular film that won me over 
Uh, so this past year, I um, I reentered. Uh, I went back to college uh, to get my grad degree, and I took um, African American history. And one of the readings we had in this class was August Wilson's play Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. And I read the play, and I was blown away. And then I found out they're making a movie out of it. And then Chadwick Boseman died. And then this movie became far more significant than I think it would have been because this was his final performance and what a performance it was. Ma Rainey's Black Bottom came out on Netflix uh, late December and it is a powerhouse. It's a film that Chadwick Boseman elevates with his performance. He is, there's a scene in this movie where he is cursing God for for ruining his life. And that takes on such a strong and powerful connotation now. Because he knew he was dying. And I just, I, I, I thought I admired him before. Yeah. After watching that film, he brought me to tears. And I just, I don't even know what to say. It was, it was lights out. And I wanted him to be in my list. Ah, fuck yeah, man. Uh, Mr. Bozeman, uh, just when we thought that was it with Defy Bloods, right? We thought that was it. Nope. You know, we got, we got one more, one more just kind of kick-ass performance. And he wouldn't, he, he wouldn't want anything else. You know, he wouldn't want anything else but for us to see him doing his thing, tearing up his own, tearing up his craft one more time yeah to to end off a really really tough year so ma rainey's barely 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 missed my my cut um awesome movie a great double feature with fences if you want to get go into that world um yeah i know you i know you got to do that basically (laughs) (laughs) so um special stuff i'm glad it's on your list i i i find it to be a, a pretty impactful film and i very much hope to see both Chadwick and Viola uh, up for some, up for some stuff and award season. So good, good pick, man. That's your number eight. That's my number eight. Yeah, it was all between, right. Yeah. It was between Ma Rainey and the five bloods, but Bozeman's scene where he's cursing God put it just above. Yeah, totally fair. I understand that the five bloods did not make, did not make my list either. You know, mm-hmm. it's tough, tough, you know, that's a great film, but, but, but Ma Rainey, I, I do, I do like a, a bit more. That one, that was the one that kind of just barely got edged out of this list. Uh, man, we're getting down. We're, we're, we're moving here. We got number sevens now. Um, and this would be, of course, I'm going to be that guy. I'm going to talk about a documentary. <laughs> uh, at my number seven is Boy State on Apple TV. Plus, this is a documentary about. 17 year old boys uh, at this thing called boy state where they practice for a week, what it's going to be like to work in politics, work in government, work in all these different things. And of course, of course it being, you know, based or be, being, sorry, not based being filmed in Texas is, is a big deal because I, I love, I'm proud of the art that comes from here. So I also like to watch my state get exposed. <laughs> and Boy State not only exposes Texas, but exposes this this thing that's happening in in all states around around America. And what it is, there's a boys and girls state. And what it is is, um, you know, in Texas anyway. I think it ranges depending on how many people are in your state. But in Texas, you have 1,200 boys and 1,200 girls who go to go to these things, and you know they're split up into 600 and 600 split up into two parties. And in this documentary's case, the two parties are called the nationalists and the federalists. And they're, you know, split up to be, you have to create your own platform, create your own beliefs, create your own policies as, as a group of 617 year old boys and the other group of six, you know, 617 year old boys. And what occurs and what happens during this week is, is, is funny at times, but mostly frightening. Uh, and, and, and mostly telling you what you're about, what's going to be in charge of you in the future. 
you're watching these silly boys talk about gun control when they haven't even had a fucking job yet. You know, um, you're, you're watching them talk about, you're watching seven, you're watching 17 year old boys talk about abortion <laughs> when mm, I, you know, there's things I could say that I probably shouldn't, you know, get the fuck out of here, you know? So you, you're watching this and you're watching bad things unfold, bad habits, bad conversations amongst white, rich kids that were invited to this thing who are, yeah, who are having these horrible conversations. But what the documentary also decides to do is follow a couple of people who have some fucking hope, have some, have some faith in this country, have some faith in democracy. And one of those gentlemen's name was Rene, Rene Otero. And I would like to highlight him because he was one of the best things about 2020 for me was watching him just conduct himself during this documentary, during, during boy state. He's, he's one of, he's in one of the parties. I won't say which one he's a part of, but he, and he becomes a major member of one of the parties at boy state. And he, you know, he speaks a lot. They, they interview him a lot, Renee. And the things he has to say about Boys State and the things he has to say about being a black 17-year-old amongst a lot of white 17-year-olds is, is very, very, very fascinating. And I can see how someone would look at this documentary and see think that it maybe was um, fixed a little bit because the people that they follow all kind of have a big place within the Boys State. I understand that, but if you just break it down for what it is, Boy State is uh, can be pretty kind of like thought changing and thought altering the way you see how dangerous it can how how dangerous it can be for you know kids to have these thoughts you know and to be taught these things about gun control and and, and abortion and whatnot it's just things that they they don't have any knowledge about. And they're just speaking on freely like it's like it's nothing. I know it's a free country, but that that is not a nothing subject. Not, you know, neither of those. Uh, there's also a gentleman, Rene Otero is amazing, but there's also another gen- gentleman named Stephen Garza, who also has a very interesting approach. And he's a, a Latino boy who's from McAllen, as I believe where he is from, uh, McAllen, Texas. And a very interesting approach and, you know, much different than the most of the boys that are there and re- really kind of blew my mind on, oh, there are kids who are involved in, or, or kids who are interested in politics who, who want good things to happen. So this documentary is so American because it breaks you down and makes you angry. It makes you kind of sick to be in the country that you're in. And then it also gives you hope. And for whatever reason, I feel like as I get older, those two things happen every day. It feels like those are things that I just battle with as a person and just you battle with. The next person battles with is just Jesus. You know, it's just one step forward, two steps back sort of thing, it feels like. And watching this documentary felt like it just kind of solidified that that's what it is. And when it ended, I was like, I don't know if I should feel hopeful or scared I'm, I'm not sure and sometimes that's the point of a documentary and i thought it was done very well i i think you connor would be so angry at it but you would also um f- find find a little bit of hope in it again with, within certain individuals and that's kind of what we do right we find hope within individuals politicians and celebrities and whatnot we just kind of oh that guy represents something good you know we'll latch on to him you know and that's that's the kind of the whole idea and they're doing it with 17 year old boys, you know, grooming them to be that way before they should even be talking about it. It's crazy. That whole concept scares the shit out of me that they are, there are places where rich families can send their teenagers to learn about the nation's problems without any prior knowledge or like involvement. That's how you create bad leaders. <laughs> And I don't like that at all. Jesus Christ. No. Yeah. I, I think I really do think you should check it out, man. Cause it's, it's, yeah, it's like infuriating at times and being from Texas, you know, it's, it's all in Austin. Uh, they're at the Capitol, you know, a lot and it, it, yeah, it's appalling at times. 
Appalling. Renee, Renee, Renee Otero and Steven Garza. They give you a little bit of hope. Oh, well, I hope I, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll vote for those guys one day. No, Renee Otero went on to, he won some, some really impressive award. I'm a, kind of upset. I didn't look it up. Uh, just, I, I've thought a lot about him since I watched Boy State. Um, you gave me your, I don't have Apple TV plus you gave me your login. And that was like one of the first things I watched. Uh, Cause it's, it's an a 24 documentary. They don't really ever do that. Yeah. So I, I, I feel like I should, I should check it out. And it, it won some shit at, at the Sundance and yeah, it, it's, yeah, it's pretty effective. Right on, man. Right on. Um, my number seven is another film I know is going to be higher up on your list, and I'm sorry for stealing your thunder yet again. Um, this is a film we were both very much looking forward to. We built an entire episode of Oscar Sunday around it, and it is Mank. Yeah, that's my number three. Yeah. <laughs> It's all right. Yeah, I know. It's okay. I always, I always feel bad about it. <laughs> I, I, I kind of knew that one was going to be in here. Uh, how could you not? Just yeah. a masterpiece. It is. David Fincher, uh, he has one every like five years at most, like at best. But when he has one, it it's good. It's It's nice to see him work with Gary Oldman playing, you know, the legendary Herman J. Mankiewicz, the, the man who wrote Citizen Kane, among others. And this is a film that beautifully captures 19, you know, 40 LA Hollywood at its most corrupted, I think. And just, it's such an unforgiving, unflinching look at the development of what is considered in many circles to be the greatest film of all time, Citizen Kane. And how the man we all think wrote that, you know, the man we all think developed that movie didn't have fuck all to do with why we love that movie. And yeah, just an amazing performance from Gary Oldman, who I think delivers most of the time. And yeah, we, for more on our, you know, my thoughts on Mank, check out our, our Oscar Sunday on Citizen Kane. But yeah, I wanted to be in this list just for the performances and the production design. I think this was great. Yeah, it's a dream. It's an absolute dream. And I'll, again, I'll, yeah, I'll save my thoughts for it, for it later. That's a, that's a great one to have. I think it's smart to have Mank in your, somewhere in your top 10 because it's it's a movie for people who are just kind of obsessed with the history of hollywood the history of movie making especially american movie making so yeah great great pick of course that's that's my number three we'll get there later uh number six is this is a film uh this is actually the last movie i got to see in theaters before everything shut down i haven't been back since uh well well you and i saw tommy boy that was actually the last movie i really saw but that's a 1995 release <laughs> new release would be celine siama's portrait of a lady on fire that came out you know and i'll clear this up it came out in new york city in los angeles on christmas or a little bit before christmas sometime in late december but then it didn't come out uh in the united states nationwide until february of 2020 so that's when i got to see it at the bijou Missed that place dearly. Saw this one with my dad and um, opened the door to Celine Siama, who now now I've seen all of her movies. Water Lilies, uh, Tomboy, Girlhood, and Portrait of Lady on Fire. Those four, that's her four you know, feature films. And I'm kind of in love with all of them, but Portrait's the one that kind of, because I saw in theaters, it's kind of the one that caused me to go down that road. Um, sh- she is... Celine is so relentless about telling stories that haven't been told for, for, for forever in movie making and her dedication to that, to telling female perspectives, telling, you know, stories about what young women go through, what 25 year old women go through and figuring out a way to, to get inside the mind of, of, of these, these characters, Celine Siama, she, she's a writer and director who feels like she's so a part of what she's doing. So a part of each scene that's unfolding and has such a hand on, on each film that's happening. A portrait of Lady on fire. That's what struck me the most was 
I'm, I'm in good hands. I'm literally in, I'm in someone's world right now. And I can tell that the vision is folding exactly how she wanted to. And she's kind of done that with all four movies. I blown away when a filmmaker is able to do that once and then twice and then three times and four times. And, Oh, that's just how she is. She just knows exactly what she's doing when it comes to filmmaking. Totally reminds me of Kelly Reichardt, just kind of fucking scary how skilled she is. Um, I think it's on Hulu still, maybe portrait of lady on fire. I just think it's, you know, just a jaw dropping kind of movie that features two performances that could, could be the two like best performances I've seen of, 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 of the whole year. That'd be Adele Hanel who, who's dated Celine Siama before. And then I don't know how to say her name exactly. Noemi Merlant. Um, again, I, I'm sorry for, if I mistake any of these names, they're French women and, I've said some, I said some Polish names earlier, you know, <laughs> I don't know, you know, I'm kind of all over the place. I, I think, I think this movie belongs in the, in my 2020 list just because of, you know, the circumstances. And if I lived in LA, I wouldn't, I would probably have it on my 2019 list, but that's not the case. I live in San Antonio, Texas, so it belongs on my list. And with a special and weird year, like 2020 might as well throw in, you know, something that was kind of on the, on the border there. <laughs> yes indeed i remember when you saw this one yeah you were raving about it you yeah i know i i'm I, i'm gonna check this out eventually yeah you'll, you'll you'll dig it it's a pretty pretty uh amazing love story yeah that i think you'll you'll appreciate right on right on my number six is another film i almost didn't watch because the uh critic response to it was devastating and eventually I just buckled. I was like, well, you know what? I am bored and I want to see this. So I watched Hillbilly Elegy. Oh, here we go. Amy Adams and Glenn Close. If they don't win Oscars next, like this, this year, I'm, I'm going to be so pissed because their performances are maybe the best of their careers. And that is really saying something. This is a film about a broken family in the Appalachia region uh, trying to heal. And it was completely destroyed by critics. Unfairly, I, I believe. I think people read way too much into it, uh, made it political, which was stupid. This movie has nothing to do with politics. And I don't know. Yeah, I, I cannot understand why this film was just massacred. Because it is such a beautiful family drama that is so painful and so real. Uh, it's about a kid who grew up with a single mom who kind of hated being a parent, just like was on drugs the whole time, abused her kids, just was a bad person. And he grew up mostly raised by his grandmother who hated having to do this, but wanted to make sure he was okay. And uh, Amy Adams is the mom, Glenn Close is the grandma, mama, as they call her. And this kid, JD, grows up to go to Harvard Law School and then gets a call saying his mom OD'd and has to, he has to go back home and fix this. But while there, he's thinking, like, why me? Why do I have to fix this? Why is it always my problem? You know, he's, he's skipping out on a huge job interview for this. And throughout the movie, you're thinking, like, how is anything going to be better after this? But it's a true story, and it is so touching. I, I can't sing this film's praises enough because nobody else is. And I want people to, to give this film a chance. I really do. I was so blown away. I've been thinking about it nonstop since I watched it. It was so fantastic. And I really want it to get Oscar attention, but because the critics hated it, I'm pretty sure it's going to be shut out. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's very rare that the Academy will um, give nominations out to a film that got canned like that year, you know? Yeah. Very frustrating. I have not seen that yet. I, I know you, you texted me right away when you watched it and I, I will, I will watch it, especially before the Oscars, just so I can also share your frustration. Um, <laughs> Netflix, <laughs> uh, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. A Netflix original, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 I just, 
you know, Amy Adams is a, a performer that has strung together now almost like a almost like a perfect 15 year run sort of thing. <laughs> and, you know, starting with like June bug all the way till, till now, till from what you're saying from to hillbilly, just really impressive. And she's kind of in to me in the, you know, debate for best performer in their prime right now. She's in that conversation. Oh dude. Like her work in this is. Light. Yeah. So that's why I need to see it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I will. I, I, I'll definitely see it. Um, you know, I, I think I'll be able to carve some time. Just one of these random nights, you know, that's like we we're kind of explaining what we did with those uh, top five first time watches. It's like you just randomly carve time out. You just do, you know. Yeah. And I know I know there's going to be one night where I'm like, all right, tonight's the night time for Hillbilly. And, I, and I'll just go for it. Uh, yeah, I knew that was I knew that was coming somewhere. Right. I knew that was going to be on your list because yeah, you were you're impacted by that one. So that was that was your number six. We're we're down to our top fives here, ladies and gentlemen. And you know my number three is Mank, and you know my number two is Sound of Metal, and we know that your number three is Justice League Dark Apocalypse War. All right. Number five. I I don't think this made yours. I, I just don't see it being in your top five, but I, I, I do know you watched it because of me. So <laughs> that'd be uh that'd be uh the woman I just brought up a little bit ago when I was talking about Celine Siama, someone she reminds me of, and that's Kelly Reichart and her masterpiece 2020 film, First Cow. Yes. Just a, mm, mm, goddamn, just a, an American, American gem here. Two gentlemen just surviving, you know, making some, making some goddamn biscuits, you know, <laughs> trying, trying to, trying to fucking survive in, in, in Oregon. What more do you want? You know, I, I, I found, I think his name is Orion. Orion Lee, he plays this character named King Lou in First Cow. I found it to be one of the most subtle, subtly dominant performances that I've kind of engaged and encountered in a while. Very rarely are you, are you kind of blown away by a, uh, by a performance like that where he's not, he's not meaning to do that. He's not all in your face. He's not yelling. It's just the way he looks. You can tell this guy's lived a life and you can, you can feel it in this performance from this actor. And John Magaro plays cookie. Jesus Christ, this guy, this guy's going to have a career. My friends, <laughs> he really is. Uh, I, I, I thought it was totally engaging right from the beginning when you see, uh, you know, a girl kind of come across these, these remains and then it goes way back in time, you know, and then then we're we're with the two people I've been talking about King Lou and cookie. Those are our two main characters. First cow right now, I believe is on showtime. I think that's what it's on right now. It's an a 24 film. It got to be in theaters for just a little bit, did okay. Um, And then, you know, everything happened and it kind of got forgotten, you know? Um, I do think there's an audience that has been kind of obsessed with it all year that has been like, Whoa, this is, in any other year, you know, this this is something that this is one of those A24 movies people will just be raving about. And I'm really glad you got to see this one. Really glad you got to, you know, engage in it, review it. And I was I, I love that because Kelly Reichart is very dear to me. This is a, a woman who I think deserves so much more acclaim than she gets as an American filmmaker. What she does in River of Grass in 1994 to Wendy and Lucy in 2008 to now the, the growth as a filmmaker, the growth as a writer and as a director is, is, a, is amazing. It's, it's like the American dream. It's like, she has gone from look what, you know, I can do with what little I have in river of grass in 1994, just kind of an auteur at work. And just doesn't really make sense that she's able to make such a good movie with that little when you, when you're, when you're watching it unfold to, First cow is like, holy shit, who's directing this? <laughs> is that like who who who's behind the camera now? Is Deacons working back there? What's going on? You know, you really feel like there's a genius because there is. And Kelly Reichardt is, is her name, and she needs to be in that conversation. At this point, it's at this point, she's done it. She's this is a this is an undisputed, awesome, awesome flick. First cow is undisputedly, I think one of the better movies of the year. I don't think anyone could say 
that it's that it's not. You know, I, I really do think it should be in that that best picture five. I think it's that kind of a movie, um, not just for me, but I think in general. Uh, I know you I know you enjoyed it a lot. It's not on your list here, but I know you you have some respect for it. Yeah, it was good. It was a film I didn't expect to watch. I actually had gotten it in the mail specifically to give it to you because I didn't know you had any way to watch it. And I was like, I was seeing you the next day. So I thought, well, fuck it, I'll watch it. And it was, it was mesmerizing. It was really engaging. And you like these guys and you, God, I wanted to try those biscuits. (laughs) Oh my God. I know. They remind me of London. (laughs) Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. I wanted one of those biscuits real bad. Solid movie. First cow. Hell yeah. It's just, so crazy simple it's such a simple idea two guys steal milk make biscuits that's the whole movie but you are drawn in for some inexplicable reason and i do think it is because kelly reichardt is a talent yeah she's totally in charge of her craft and you know you you, i I remember writing a review for wendy and lucy and sent it to you and it's very similar it's like girl dog life you know and things things just unfold and but kelly reichardt has has the talent there to just make it make it a film make it interesting make it worth watching even if it is just two guys kind of going through the last parts of their life i you know it's fucking incredible it really is yeah good pick good pick um so that was your five yeah, yeah, I, I think you knew that was coming. You know, I, Ke- <laughs> Kelly's my Kelly's my girl. I love her. <laughs> right on. Number five. I I don't know if you knew this was coming, but once you hear it, I don't think you'll be surprised. Um, so this year, Pixar released two films. Uh, ah. <laughs> Soul, okay. Soul was December's big one, but earlier this year they released Onward. Yes. Hilarious, brilliantly creative fantasy epic about a modern like fantasy world where elves work at Burger King and shit like that. And this one young elf gets a present from his late father on his 16th birthday. That's a wizard staff. And using this staff, he brings back his dad partially just his legs. And they, and he and his brother have till sun like sundown to get this magic rock that can bring back their dad fully. And the adventure is them bonding over resurrecting their dad to say goodbye to him it is such a touching film uh mainly because the guy who made it wrote it after losing his father this was his way of coping and the movie is very much about family and about who who matters to you the most and i really and i really related to this film and i was like i've seen it twice now and both times i have just collapsed into tears and I love that Pixar still has the ability to do that to me. And I thought Onward was, I loved Soul, but Onward was light years ahead of Soul for me. Just because of how it, it honed into one particular like hang up of mine. And it just exploited that. And it just rocked me to my core. And I can't sing this film's praises enough. Can I, can I ask what that would be? Well, I have, uh, you know, I have a rocky relationship with my own father. I haven't, yeah. uh, you know, I he left when I was a kid. I've had kind of on and off contact with him over my life. So films where that deal with, you know, the loss of a father or the emotional unavailability of a father, I tend to, it, they tend to get me a lot harder than other films. I, I have no shame in admitting that. And uh, Onward was one of those films. Yeah, no, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, that's... Uh... When you put that in front, in, out in front of yourself and in front of you know other people, and especially when you just kind of allow it to be uh, a thing that you know is in in your mind, you know you're not just shoving it to the back. You know it's there, and you you, you watch a movie like a Han word that's intended for children, and you're like, no, 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 this is intended for me, motherfucker. <laughs> you know yeah. that's that's kind of that's what we're that's what we've been talking about all episode. That's what it's all about. It's like when a movie finds you where you're at. Ah, oh, like, holy shit! That's so cool. <laughs> that's what that's what it's all about. I think Onward has a tremendous amount of power, and I cannot wait to rewatch that one. I've only seen it the one time when we we both watched it way back when it came out, <laughs> and 
I love that Disney Plus has done that twice now with their two monster Pixar movies. They've just given them to us on the streaming service, you know, and that's that's really nice to have. Um, I know you got to you you actually got to see that one in theaters. Yeah, that was the last uh, wide released film I saw uh, apart from Tommy Boy um, before everything kind of shut down. And I was really surprised. I went to see it like Saturday afternoon when it should have been hopping and it was just me. And I was like, I told, I don't remember who the server was, but I was like, dude, what's going on here? And he's like, people aren't going to the movies anymore, man. Because at the time we were still kind of hoping this whole you know, virus thing would be contained. We didn't realize how bad it was going to get. And yeah, from there, it just, this was a nice farewell to the movie theaters onward. And uh, yeah, that's all I got to say about that. Beautiful. Beautiful. I had a feeling it was coming. I didn't, but then as you got higher and higher, I was like, man, where's onward at (laughs) there, there it is. Oh man, we're getting to the nitty gritty here. Um, We don't know what my number four and what my number one are. And we still don't know what your number four, number two and number one are. So let's get to the number fours. Uh, Mine's a Danish movie. (laughs) Oh, Uh, starring Mads Mikkelsen. Ooh. Directed by Thomas Vinterberg, the man who directed The Hunt, starring Mads Mikkelsen. And it's called Another Round. It's a movie I, I, I just rented it. It looked awesome. And I was like, I don't give a shit. I paid whatever. It was like $5.99 or something um, through Amazon. And just totally blown away. Another Round is Mads Mikkelsen's the main guy. But there's, you know, four uh, teachers, high school teachers who... You know, kind of going through a tough time, right? They're trying to find some inspiration and they start testing with, with alcohol <laughs> while, uh, while teaching. And, you know, things start to kind of tumble and, you know, they go out and drink together too. And then lines get blurred, right? And Mads Mikkelsen, while he is the main character, some, some things happen to the other three gentlemen that do this experiment with him this experiment of drinking and eventually it becomes to a, a point where they want to be, you know, at 0.05 uh, BAC blood alcohol content throughout the whole day until 8 PM and then stop drinking. That's the idea. It's someone's theory. I can't remember who it is. Let me look it up real quick. Um, It's a actual theory that you're supposed to, it's, it's sarcastic, but it's also like a real thing. Uh, I'll look it up. Hold on. My God. Uh, yeah, no, it's amazing. And I, I thought about you a lot. I was like, God, Connor would love this movie. First off, because Mads Mikkelsen is wonderful. And if I could give an award out to the best performance of the year, it would undoubtedly be Mads Mikkelsen in another round. I'm kind of a sucker for him anyway. You know, he just, he has a look that I just, I kind of can't look away from everything he does. So let's see. Four friends test the theory, maintaining a constant level of alcohol in their blood. Yeah, the theory is that the theory is that you're born with 0.5 less than what you're supposed to be. <laughs> that's the that's the whole joke. Yeah, fucking hilarious. But uh, it's not on anything, so I can't re- I can't say you know you have to rent this. You have to pay money for it. I know that that fucking sucks, but it is well worth it. Well worth it. Kind of kind of shook me. Like I threw it on and was like, this is probably gonna be really good. You know, I, I see it was up at, you know, up at the Cannes film film festival and whatnot and has all these different things about it. Typical, you know, foreign indie film. That's, it also has this amazing guy, Mads Mikkelsen at the start at the front of it. And, but I was, I was, I was taken aback. I was taken aback and I couldn't believe that Thomas Venterberg could make a movie like the hunt that I love so much from 2012 and then do this Just two two very different movies. Uh, incredible filmmaker. Uh, I, I really don't want to share too much about this one. I really don't. I'm still trying to find the name of the theory. Uh, da, da, da. Ah, here you go. Psychiatrist Finn Scudderdurd, Scudderdurd, who has theorized that having a blood alcohol content of 0.05 makes you more creative and more, more relaxed. Yeah, so that's an actual thing. And in the movie, they, they test it out. So it's very fun. <laughs> I definitely want to see that movie, but that theory sounds like some drunk trying to explain why he's drunk to his wife and it getting way out of hand. 
<laughs> Let's see. Finn Scotterdard is a Norwegian psychiatrist, psychotherapist, author, and professor. He leads the psychotherapy project at Oslo University Hospital, runs a private practice at the psychiatrist for the Norwegian Olympic Committee, working with elite athletes. That's the last guy I'd want to be blotto all day. <laughs> right? Yeah, no kidding. Ah, man. Good film, though. Definitely, definitely something that made me just kind of think about all kinds of stuff. And, and um, you know, drinking's been something that I've, like, when I first turned 21, I just, I kind of got out of control. You know, like, the, the first couple of years, from, like, 21 to 23 or so, I kind of got out of control uh, a bit there and just was, like, drinking too much and 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 whatnot. And there's there's some stuff here that could be touchy, you know, if if that's a, an area that maybe you've struggled or whatnot, there, there is, there's some, some meat here in the movie that that's pretty tough to handle. And uh, while also being like hilarious, it, it does, it it felt similar to what, here's a comparison, uh, Little Miss Sunshine, what Little Miss Sunshine did to me, just kind of like, oh my God, I'm laughing and rolling on the floor, but then I'm like, oh my God, you know, just kind of shattered. Kind of did that totally different movie, but you know, it's a, a comparison. I think you can, I like that about film when you can kind of, the emotions that it gives you and another round did that uh incredible finale yeah just can't can't wait for you to see it connor so uh, a, a danish movie again called uh, another round directed by thomas Vinterberg, written by thomas Vinterberg, and gotta gotta rent it through through amazon it's 5.99 is this the film you sent me a video of the credits playing since yes. Strut? yes yes I yes i thought so i thought so well well, real quick. Okay. So yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. So Sissy Strut not only plays in the credits, but there's a scene where all four teachers are hanging out and drinking and dancing and that song's playing. And they're just kind of, I mean, I mean, picture Mads Mikkelsen holding a glass dancing to Sissy Strut. That's, that's all you need. That's all I need in 2020, baby. <laughs> my God, this one's going right on my list. Yeah. I definitely want to see this. You, yeah. You, yeah. You'll fall in love. Yeah. <laughs> um, my number four, is a film I was not expecting to adore as much as I did. Uh, originally, it was supposed to come out uh, earlier this year. was kind of billed as a black comedy. Uh, a film, when I did see it, is kind of devoid of genre. It's funny at times. It's horrific at times. It's sad at times. It's kind of everything. And it's Promising Young Woman. Oh, hell yeah. Uh Finally got a theater release on, I think, Christmas Day. And uh, I, I went and saw it. I was alone in the theater. Uh, that was kind of cool. You know, shitty how it happened because nobody else is going to the movies for obvious reasons. But I got a whole theater yeah. to myself for Promising Young Woman, and I was mesmerized from beginning to end. This is one of the most scathing societal critiques I've ever seen. Carrie Mulligan is absolutely phenomenal. And I have a whole new respect for her as an actress. Uh, Bo yeah. Burnham, holy shit. I didn't know he could go there, but he fucking goes there. He's, I love him. I love his, uh, his comedy. And I, I want him to do more stuff like this. He is so, so underrated. And it's just a, it's such a sad story, but it's played in such a smart way. It's like one of the best revenge movies I've ever seen. And uh, it's got a great cast. Alfred Molina is in this. Clancy Brown is in this. Uh, Connie Britton is in this. It's crazy. And it's just about a woman getting justice for her best friend who was raped in college and nobody took it seriously. And so now she's taking it seriously in a, like, in a dark, oddly comical way that ultimately ends in crazy left field tragedy but ultimately like one of the most satisfying endings i've seen in years like as soon as i was done with this i rushed over to heb and was like dude you need to see this <laughs> it crazy was amazing yeah one of the best of the year i i knew immediately like this is going in my top five and here it is genius i love it yeah i cannot wait to see this movie man i'm i've read awesome stuff and you you immediately told me, holy shit, that was amazing. You know, I remember I texting me right away and I saw you that day because you let me. What movie did you give me? Possessor, uh, yeah. which is a 2020 movie that did not make my list. I know it didn't make yours, but we both dug it. You know, it's a, it's a dope ass idea from Bernie Cronenberg, the son of David. So 
that's dope. That's dope. But um, didn't quite make the cut from for for either of us there. No. Oh man. Yeah. That's yeah. Had to be there. I knew that was. I knew that was coming. <laughs> I will definitely be buying this film. So don't worry. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, it's going to make an incredible film, guys, in, uh, one of these days. Um. All right. Well, we're down to our top three. We know my number three is Mank, so we can talk a little bit about it now, a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> I don't have. I don't have a whole lot to say without sounding extremely biased. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, this is hypothetically take away COVID altogether. This is, this is my most anticipated movie of 2020 anyways, no matter what was happening, you know, even if every movie would have gone to theaters, COVID didn't happen at all. I Mank was the one I was, you know, that I was just ready for either, you know, no matter what. So I feel very, very grateful to have gotten it the way that it was going to be released anyway. You know, it was going to be for Netflix. We knew this, we knew this all year anyways, without COVID even interrupting the movie industry altogether. So with all that being said, I, I feel very grateful for, for Mank being on, being on Netflix and for being a fan of venture stuff and whatnot. But th- the film itself, the reason it's number three on my list, the reason I think it's, you know, Fincher's best movie since uh, Social Network. It confronts some stuff that people have kind of made fun of Fincher for himself. It confronts some stuff like the title alone, what it's about, Mank, Mankwicks, you know, the writer of Citizen Kane, the idea that you know, in American cinema that the director has all control. The director does everything. The director, it's all about the director. It's all about a film by. And David Fincher, of course, is a guy who doesn't write all of his, you know, screenplays, doesn't do all of that work. He's a guy who's been called out as, oh, you're just the big name in front of it, but all these other people are doing all this legwork for you. You know, this is an idea that Orson Welles has dealt with. This is an idea that I think putting on the screen nowadays after a hundred years of movies being made, I think is really cool to see. I think it's really cool to see a director play with that himself and have a movie made about a screenplay writer who actually wrote a movie that happens to be citizen fucking Kane, you know, messing with that entire world and not only messing with it, but making a really cool and interesting film. Eric Messerschmidt, that is the cinematographer director of photography for Mank. That was the eye that I was most impressed with when I watched Mank. David Fincher, of course, is a huge, huge name that we all all know. But, you know, when I'm watching Mank, I'm seeing this is a little bit more precise than even anything Fincher has done. And I, I don't know how he's, how has he topped himself again? You know, how does he keep doing this? You know, oh, it's, you know, it's all these people he's also working with. And that's what's so cool about Mank itself is it's about the guy who wrote Citizen Kane, but doesn't get all the, on Orson Welles film, Citizen Kane, Orson Welles as Citizen Kane, Charles Foster Kane. He doesn't get any of that shit, right? So to do that it, it, it is so fascinating. And so I was looking deep into, you know, the people who were involved with this film and just some names that popped popped out to me. And Eric Messerschmidt was at the top of that list. He also worked on Fargo TV series, FX, Legion on FX, with Noel Hawley on both of those shows, Mindhunter, Mank, and that's it for the guy. The guy clearly is someone that Fincher has either you know seen and worked with now and Mindhunter and been like, that's someone I want to bring in. These are the decisions that make a movie like Mank that's trying so many things at once. That's what makes it work, right? The screenplay written by Jack, (laughs) written by his brother. Um, That's a big deal, right? This, this screenplay is very much something that is trying to kind of, you know, embody who Mank was, right? The kind of slapstick style. And I think that's really interesting. I think all those touches matter so much. I know you saw them, but I think a lot of people just kind of didn't see it as a quote unquote Fincher film. Yeah. Well, that's not exactly what he was trying to do. You know, it was, it was more than that. It was uh, trying to do a lot of different things. Um, I saw there is Jack, his dad or his brother. It's his dad. 
that's right. That's right. Sorry. I said, brother, I meant to say father. That's, that's my fault. Um, and that's, that's, it's really special to see that Jack and David, uh, on the same, you know, little, little card there under as director and writer. That's, that's pretty special to see. Yeah, for sure. Especially since his father passed before he could see the movie made. Yeah. He passed what year was it just, um, just before, I mean, cause this movie was Mank Mank was in the making for like 20 something years. So yeah. Like since the nineties, it was. Ridiculous. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Jack Fincher, uh, passed away in 2003. Jesus. See, yeah. 17 years ago. God damn. Un- unbelievable. The things that go into a movie as grand as Mank. I-, I just love all those little things. And, and then when you take all that away, just the movie itself, I love it. I thought it was so entertaining. I thought the performance, Amanda Seyfried, oof. if that, that would be my one complaint about the whole thing was I would just like to have her on the screen a little bit more because she was so damn good. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, that's, you know, that's just one little thing. So I think it's a brilliant two hour movie. I would have loved a bit more Charles Dance. Uh, yeah, I want I was hoping to see more of, you know, her revenge almost like how much he came down on this film. But I guess that's more, you know, Orson Welles handled that. This is this isn't that part of the story. This is Herman's side of the story. And he just wrote the damn thing. <laughs> and got drunk a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So cool. You could make so many movies out of the making of Citizen Kane. And yeah, this was a good, this was a good one to see. It was a cool story. And I'm glad like through it, you know, I got to watch Pride of the Yankees, which was amazing. And uh, have a, you know, a whole new respect for a filmmaker I didn't even know about. Yes. Yeah. Great stuff. And, and of course, any excuse to go back and watch Citizen Kane is nice too. Yeah, with a whole new eye. And that was a that was a solid episode. <laughs> yes, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. My number three is a film that I really didn't know much about, but I'm always down to see a DC animated film. And I didn't know that there was an established continuity. Uh, Justice League, The Flashpoint Paradox in 2013 set up a 16 film strong continuity that Justice League Dark Apocalypse War ended. So now I have a lot of homework because this film blew my fucking mind. (laughs) This was the coolest. Like I had like, you know, emotional levels I felt when I saw Avengers Endgame with this movie. This was, it opens with the Justice League being massacred by Darkseid's army and Darkseid conquering earth that's the first five minutes that's incredible like already you're like what is this and then from there it's the remnants of earth's heroes joining forces for one last assault to save earth one last time led by a powerless superman who has been injected with liquid kryptonite to suppress his powers but dark side kept him alive just so he could watch earth die that is incredibly dark The fact that you don't have, like DC does not have this team running their films division is fucking bonkers. You take this film, you make it live action, you use the exact same script, you have a two, three billion dollar grocer on your hands. Like, what is, what is going on over there? (laughs) I I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It, It literally is light years better than anything they've done the past decade. Like yeah. light years. And we, we've brought up, we've brought up movies uh, a little bit older, you know, Phantasm, Mask of the Phantasm and uh, Return of the Joker, stuff like that. Yeah. But this is, this is 2020. <laughs> and you're telling me, like you said, you're telling me y'all have made 17 of these motherfuckers and y'all can't string together two goddamn good movies. Like what's going on here? Not just that, but like all of these animated flicks are fucking awesome. Like they're just, like way better than anything DC's pumping out live action. I mean, this movie, you have like what's left of the justice league, the teen Titans and the suicide squad join forces to fuck up dark side. Are you kidding me? Like what this whole time? I was just like on the edge of my seat. Like, how did I not know about this? What is this secret masterpiece that nobody is talking about? This is the best superhero movie of the year. And I think if, you know, we'd gotten Black Widow, 
I still think this would have been the best of the year. This this is a movie I want everybody to see. Every DC fan, every comic book fan, like this is just so cool. Straight up, so so cool. And I didn't know about the continuity, so now I know there's an ongoing story in these, and now I have to go back and watch like Son of Batman and Throne of Atlantis and Batman versus Robin and all these films I just didn't really check out. So now I have, you know, a whole 16 fr- film franchise to check out. This is fucking great. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's fantastic. When, Because, yeah, when you told me about the film, and of course this was my number nine on my list, uh, <clears throat> when you told me about it, I looked it up and I saw, immediately saw that there, yeah, that it was, there was multiple. And I was like, oh, no. Because I could tell right away, like you said, with stuff hap- with the stuff happening with Dark Side, I could tell that I, this is going to be content that I want to see. Yeah. I'm not going to say I need to see. I want to. I want it. I want. I, I want good quality, gritty shit for superheroes like this. This is what I want. This is what yeah. I want. I don't give a shit about you know, like you said, it's the best superhero movie of the year. Just by a fucking landslide you know it's not even close uh i was blown away blown away and i i'm with you i'm we're in the same boat that we're both just going to go back and watch as much as these as we can because jesus christ it's a lot of fun so we'll we'll we'll, we'll bring them back up as we watch them you know and uh let you guys know <laughs> what i was already i was already watching these but i wasn't paying that kind of attention because i didn't know this was like a marvel mcu style ongoing thing and now I'm just going to be like, you know, one after another binging this shit. I own a lot of them. I buy these all the time because they randomly end up on clearance shelves because nobody's really watching them beyond hardcore DC fans. Nobody cares. And that's sad because these films could be like, they should be listed among DC's greatest masterpieces, especially this one. Uh, yeah. And it's hilarious too. Like my favorite part is King shark constantly just saying, King Shark is a shark. Like that's King all he shark says. Is a shark. Yeah. Until he tells Captain Boomerang, "It's been an honor fighting with you." And Boomerang just turns to him and is like, "Are you shitting what me?" The? Yeah. <laughs> it's it's brilliant. The timing is perfect. It's it's awesome. God. Mm. Yeah. I was so I was not expecting this to rock my world, but holy shit. <laughs> yeah, oh. man. It definitely definitely threw me for a loop. <laughs> I was. <laughs> Yeah, I was pretty pretty blown away. I'm I'm really glad you you suggested I watch it before we do this episode because I'm I'm glad it's on both of our lists, uh, yeah. and would be would be just a wonderful wonderful episode, so we can really dive into all those films. Um, oh boy, we're we're down to the the top two here, and you, everyone knows my my number two. That'd be Sound of Metal. Uh, you had it in your number ten. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So S- Sound of Metal. Um, Written and directed by Darius Martyr. It's a gentleman who worked on The Place Beyond the Pines, worked on the screenplay with Derek Chianfrance. And I, I think it shows there with that kind of tone in that movie. You know, you got Ryan Gosling's character tatted up, wearing Metallica t-shirts, and with his his hair is bleach blonde. And then we have Riz Ahmed here, <laughs> tatted up, <laughs> playing playing drums for a metal band, and he's got bleach blonde hair. Uh I I it's a it's a similar vibe. It's a it's a I think it's a area of indie filmmaking that I, I certainly lean towards this kind of um, patience, this kind of patient filmmaking with these characters that are, that are tough that I've, you know, been, been through, you know, some sort of tumultuous period, but don't spell it out for you. Uh, and then let it kind of organically unfold through, more tumultuous stuff happening so that other stuff gets brought up and that's sometimes is how life goes even if it's depressing sometimes it's just shit after shit after shit and sound of metal does does just that while also refusing without giving away too too much of it the the movie refuses to give you to just throw you a bone yeah. It it does it does not allow you to be really comfortable at all. Uh, from the writing to the directing to just how Riz Ahmed just carries himself, you know, always you know, kind of always moving, always looking for the next thing, always moving to the next cigarette, always moving to the next 
thing that he can that he can do. Go, go, go. Uh, and then when you're you're kind of hit with the hit with his reality, right? You're you as a viewer are just kind of forced to confront that in your own life. Um, of course, Sound of Metal is about a guy who loses his hearing. So that's very early on in the film and it's very much what they're showing in the trailer. When that happens, you know, it's not totally the um, immediate reaction to it. It's the, the lesson that's learned after so much action, you know, and so much go, 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 go. It takes all of that for him to remember what someone told him earlier in the movie is to just, to just, to just calm down, you know? And for me, you know, first off, <laughs> Marvel red shorts are the, the cigarettes I smoke and that's what he's smoking in this thing. So I have, I have a huge issue with sometimes holding on and waiting. The next thing will come. The next day will come. Just enjoy what you have here. And sometimes I struggle with that and wa- watching this movie you have no, you have no where to run as a viewer. There's nowhere to hide. There's no cheesy shit happening. It's coming at you full speed. And no matter where you're at in your life, you know that you probably could use a little more time to just shut up. Don't look at your phone. Don't read anything. Don't watch a movie. Just, just calm down. Just kind of sit still for a moment. And when a movie does like exactly that actually puts that idea in front of you and then ends. That's all I can really ask for in, in, in movies when I'm, when I'm going out there, watch something new that I haven't seen before, something like that, an ending like that in sound of metal where it, you know, it forces you to confront stuff, forces you to, to have your own ideas about not just what's happening to this character in the movie, but what about you? You know, that's, that's powerful. (laughs) That's some powerful shit. It really is a reflective film. And I like the way that it it addresses uh, disability, the way that it doesn't, you know, as much as um, Riz Ahmed's character wants to see this as, a, you know, a setback and just a, a horrible thing that happens to him, everyone around him is saying, you know, this is just the next step of your life, man. This is not, you know, you're not dead. You're not broken. You're just different now and he never accepts that and it's it's tough to watch him never accept that you know usually i don't like uh when there's not a lot of character development but in this case the idea of him never accepting this works so well and i just yeah i i liked it a lot and i thought riz ahmed carried that idea so well you could feel the chip on his shoulder the entire time he's constantly like right there about to freak the fuck out at all times yeah oh which is yeah when he's in his in that rv and starts just smashing his stuff is like that's acting you know that's like whoa how do you go there without you know you're playing a character right now and so yeah i i agree with you i echo that riz Ahmed is just pretty lights out the the gentleman who's at the the home that he goes to uh paul paul i don't know how to say his last name rachi he plays joe that guy's actually deaf that's uh that's an impressive fucking performance right there that's a guy who's been that's a guy who's been in three movies his whole life and just kind of carried himself like he was a 30-year vet like what the fuck who who are you you know you know (laughs) Just a, yeah, a movie I'll, I'll never forget, and I'll definitely be rewatching, even though it's it's hard to hard to digest. Absolutely, man. Absolutely, great choice, great pick. Um, my number two, uh, a film that needed to come out this year, a film that a lot of people connected with because of our very difficult, very painful election this year. Um, The Trial of the Chicago 7. This was an amazing effort by Aaron Sorkin and an amazing cast telling a story I'd never heard, 
that I have not, that has not left my mind since I saw this film. It's the mo- one of the most egregious miscarriages of justice in American history. And I, I want everybody to see this. The tagline was the whole world is watching. And it, it's felt like that this into this year. This has been a dark year and it's felt like the entire world is watching us crumble because of how we've handled it. Not just the virus, but societal issues we've always had and politics and corruption we've always had. And we've done nothing about it. And looking at this film shows we've never done anything about it. This is not new stuff. And the trial of the Chicago seven showcased that so fantastically. And I honestly believe this is the film to beat for best picture next year. Hell yeah. I like, I like that. I like that. You threw that on there at the end that you think it should, should take best picture. I think that Mank. I think those are the two front runners right now. Yeah. Yeah. Most likely. Yeah. Oh, that movie pissed me off. Something special, man. The, the trial of the Chicago seven got under Franklin, my skin. Franklin Gellar, I think deserves a, deserves a nice little nomination there. Um, you know, possibly our, you know, we did a whole episode around Borat. So Sasha Baron Cohen is, is wonderful in that movie. And of course, Sorkin, I think should get a, a screenplay nod directing maybe, but yeah. I think for sure screenplay, I think, yeah, it's, there's just some, some incredible stuff there. My, my favorite scene is John Carroll Lynch when he just says, no, we are not yeah. going to be continuing in this fashion. <laughs> Dude, how yeah. cool would it be to see John Carroll Lynch get an Oscar nomination for this? I mean, afraid, it's a uh, long shot, but it would just be really nice. I know. I, I agree with you. I, John Carroll Lynch, unfortunately, I think is going to be in the same boat as John Goodman. Just never going to get that goddamn nomination. Uh, I yeah. feel like the gold. I feel like the gold has been there. If he's not going to get it for Zodiac, what are we doing? You know, if he's not going to get a. If he's not going to get a best supporting nod for what he did in Zodiac, one of yeah. the most frightening performances I've ever seen. I just don't. I don't see it from the Academy. It sucks. <laughs> I was very impressed with Mark Rylance. In this, oh, I yes. never really. I, I thought he was good. I've never really thought he was, you know, eye opening or anything. But he was amazing as Bill Kunstler, and just you felt for the guy. He was the only one there trying to do the right thing. And I love. We ended up with what, like sixty counts of contempt, something like that, just for standing up for these people that nobody else was standing up for. Just fantastic. God damn. Well, we did a whole thing on Sorkin because of this movie, and I loved every second of it. Yeah, I loved. I I typically love every second of every Sorkin script. <laughs> uh, yeah, and trial trial adds to that. Uh, yeah, I had a feeling I was going to pop up in yours. D- didn't quite make mine again. It would have. I just crunched in a lot of stuff here at the at the end of the month, and that's what number one is. My number one is um, is something I thought about all year it actually got a little release back in late march i think it had like a small release and then they realized oh this isn't happening uh and then it was put on to vod and then i watched it on hbo max and that is eliza hitman's never rarely sometimes always i yeah i hate being a dude sometimes because uh we we have no idea Sometimes we have no goddamn idea what it's like to go through. I don't even know how to word it here, you know. To go through the uh, just constant, constant judgment and rejection and constant, you know, people thinking that they have to approve you, you know, and then you that's a cultural thing. That's a societal thing. And you add, you add that there's, there's actually a shit, shit, shit healthcare system in play. Uh, and then you add again, that's why I'm talking about being a dude. It's nice being a dude because young girls who have to ever deal with anything with the healthcare system is a, uh, is an absolute goddamn joke and never really sometimes always tells the story of a young 
17 year old girl who is pregnant and cannot tell her parents because uh, she's afraid of what they'll think. She does not know what to do. So she confides in her cousin and her cousin's like, all right, what do you know? What do you want to do? And she's like, well, I can't have this baby. So they live in a small town in Pennsylvania. So they get on a bus and go to New York city and try to do this thing. They try to figure out a way to get to a clinic and do what they need to do. And filmmaking aside, Eliza Hitman, I'll talk about her in a second. The, the plot of this movie, the, the focus on these two girls is something that I didn't, didn't quite know I needed to see and didn't quite know I needed to, to think about. Um, and already in my mind, you know, I have my qualms with uh, anyone, <clears throat> anyone wanting to control what a girl's going to do with their body. Uh, well, I, I have serious, serious issues with that. I have bigger issues with how adults in our country and are placed to work in this environment don't do their goddamn job, you know? And I, uh, watching this movie was, um, all of those things are in play, of course. And of course, of course I was pretty, pretty devastated by it. That's the plot alone. You know, there's, there's a lot that happens, but, but the plot alone is about these two girls who are trying to find their way to a city because they don't know what the fuck to do. Eliza Hitman wrote and directed it. She, <laughs> I, you know, I spoke about being in good hands with Kelly Reichardt. I mean, Eliza Hitman is, uh, is in the same category as far as from this film. She did Beach Rats 2017. I, I still haven't seen that. Now I will. But uh, this film, this is the first film I've seen her do. I immediately felt like I was, I was, I was good. I'm, whoa. This chick's watched some movies. She knows what she's doing. You know, she knows when to get a close up on this girl to make me feel exactly what she's feeling. She knows when to back up. She knows when to do a tracking shot. She knows when to play this. Every little touch was to me perfect. I think it's a ten out of ten movie. It's actually the only movie out of all these that I would give a ten. The rest of them would be nines or eights. Um, I just I was blown away. And I, I actually watched it twice in the same night because I just, I couldn't. And this is very hard to hide from you because <laughs> I, I, I want to tell you about this one a lot, but I also knew I want to save it for the show because it was, it was my number one from the get-go. I, I knew that it was going to be my number one right when the credits started playing. Um, this is this is a movie. Hey, if you're if you're a dude, wake the fuck up. Watch this movie. You know, um, girls don't need to confront this stuff. Girls deal with it. But when a movie is made from a female's perspective, with these characters, watch it. Watch it if you aren't from that perspective, because it will help you learn. It'll help you see some things. It'll help you gain some understanding. And if it doesn't, then quite frankly, you don't have a pulse. You know, <laughs> you know. Uh, that's, that's how I feel about this movie. And that's, I'm, I'm going to fucking go to bat for it forever. Uh, I, I can't wait to own it. Uh, and I can't wait to see what, what else Eliza's done. I know she's done some shorts and yeah, beach rats is a movie that was on Hulu. So I'm going to go back and check that out now. And I, I've been opened up to a whole new world and I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And I'm very grateful for the, the ability that movies have to do this to me, to, to, really break me down and make me kind of drop myself for a second and realize that dude, this shit is way bigger than me, way bigger. Wow, man. I'm, I'm moved. I really am. I didn't know how strongly you felt about this film. You'd mentioned it to me a couple of times, but I had completely forgotten about it. And I'm wow, man, I got, I'm speechless. I really am. Unreal. Yeah, well, you know, you've gotten used to just uh, this is. I'm a, I'm I'm a sucker for it, and even if it sometimes can borderline be me seeking out, you know, sentimental stuff too often, maybe, but but with never really, sometimes always, it's it's quite quite the opposite. It's very much in the same realm as waves. Like it's just it's going to hit you, whether you want it to or not, or whether you're ready or not. There's going to be some subjects here that are that are real that we all 
need to talk about and we should be on the same page but we're not yeah. and we're it never really where it gets the title is you know i i don't want to you know i'm obviously very very excited about the movie and very amped up about it and was was very moved by it and i don't want to be too hasty but but i really that particular scene i won't say exactly who it's between but when the, when those words are said to give it the title that it has one of the one of the best scenes i've seen in the past i don't know few years i don't want to give it an exact number i just i don't remember very many scenes that just kind of shook me like that like exactly like that i would put it with the scene in waves um with the father and the daughter when they finally start talking Oof. and th- those things are just on the table and um i i very much appreciate when that happens god damn Frankly speaking, I don't know how the hell I'm going to follow that. <laughs> I think I know what yours is, and I, I also had a hard time leaving it off. I went with a film, the again, the only 10 I gave as well. Um, nice. It's a film that was the first movie I saw in theaters this year. came out in January. It's kind of, like, in my opinion, at the time, set the tone for what I thought was going to be an amazing year of film. And... I mean, I was kind of, I won't say I was wrong. We did get some amazing films, but it just did not turn out the way I expected. Uh, the Gentleman. Guy Ritchie's latest masterpiece, and in my opinion, his greatest film of all time. Matthew McConaughey, Charlie Hunnam, Hugh Grant, Colin Farrell, uh, Henry Golding. One of the funniest films I've ever seen. <laughs> it's just British gangsters doing British shit and told in this, you know, your typical Guy Ritchie style of, you know, snatch and lock stock. It's, you know, let's go here, then go back to that. And wait a minute, what did you say? Let's go back to this. It's, it's a jumble, but if you're paying attention, you are along for the ride. And I, (laughs) the soundtrack is superb. Matthew McConaughey plays such a great, just gangster. I never would have thought that. Uh, Hugh Grant steals the show, in my opinion, as a sleazy tabloid asshole trying to blackmail them. Yes. Uh, Colin Farrell has a bit part as coach, this like local guy who like helps youngsters get on their feet. It's such a great movie. It's such a funny, entertaining, and at times kind of scary movie. Like there's a whole, a whole bit with a with a pig that's really hard to sell to people. <laughs> and um I'll just leave it at that because honestly, if I tell you what it is, you're not going to fucking believe me. Um, but yeah, The Gentleman is, in my opinion, the best film of 2020, bar none. And I'll go to bat for it. It, yeah, it, I, it makes me laugh harder every time I watch it. And then I also think it's one of the smartest screenplays I've ever seen. And the way it ha- tackles gangster drama in a comedic fashion. This is like, he had it in lock stock. He made it better in snatch and he fucking perfected it with the gentleman. Uh, that's awesome. Great way to put it. Oh yeah. And yeah, that's mine. Beautiful. <laughs> this was crazy. Why don't you uh, recap your top 10? Yeah. Yeah. Let's finish it off here. We, uh, I had at number 10, I had soul and then I had just League dark apocalypse war. I had the vast of night boy state portrait of lady on fire. Number five, First Cow, Another Round, Mank, Number Two, Sound of Metal, and Number One, Never Rarely, Sometimes Always. Fantastic. Uh, I had Number 10, Sound of Metal, Number Nine, The Invisible Man, Number Eight, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Number Seven, Mank, Number Six, Hillbilly Elegy, Number Five, Onward, Number Four, Promising Young Woman, Number Three, Justice League Dark Apocalypse War, Number two, The Trial of the Chicago Seven. And number one, The Gentleman. And those are our top 10 favorite films of 2020. And now from here on out, it's going forward. 2021, here we come. Yes, Thank sir. you guys for popping up for our first episode of the Sneak Preview. Tune in every Monday to see what we got coming up. We're not going to be uh, revealing next week's episode because it's going to be constantly evolving here, constantly changing because of the release schedule. So we don't want to put ourselves in a bind. So we're just going to be doing what we can every week. And uh, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to this journey. 
Hell yeah, man. It's going to be fun. Great way to start. You know, got to dive into what we just enjoyed most. And now, like you said, we're moving forward in 2021 and I already, there's going to be new releases that I just, I'm going to have so much fun talking about here on this, this podcast. Cause the other two film guys, Master Sunday are dedicated to the past. And yeah. of course, of course we want people to go to the past with us. We have Bill and Ted's excellent adventure and we have Chinatown coming up this week. Holy <laughs> shit. Fantastic. And again, you know, I just want to remind everybody genre goes out the window here. This is film. There'll be horror, drama, sci-fi, fantasy, comedy, everything. Whatever comes out this year. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Thank you guys. Check out Filmgasm on Wednesday, Oscar Sunday on Sunday. New episodes of the sneak preview every Monday. See you then. Hell yeah. Peace out.